Morning, sir.
Good morning, Ms. Hall. This is John Connick, interim administrator for OPS. Can you hear me? Ms. Hall, Ms. Hall, can you hear me? Thank you. Yes. I, I, Sorry about that. Thank you. Just want to make sure you could hear me. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. I sent everyone, um, not everyone, but I sent a message. I wasn't able to join, but it just let me in. So I am going to shut off my camera and when other people join, I'll turn my camera back on, okay? All right. And how do I do that? Morning, Mr. Hess. Hey, morning. How are you? Good, thanks. And good morning, Mr. Mountcastle. Good morning. Ms. Gouldsby, can you hear me? Can 
Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. All right, John, so I'm seeing uh, six board members here, um, which is a quorum. I know Mike Graham has informed me that he's not going to be here. Did you hear from anybody else? I think you're muted if you're talking. Uh, Mr. Hess, I, I'm checking my email right now, and I, I don't believe anybody else has reached out to me. Okay. You said Graham, Mr. Graham wasn't going to be present today. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we might just get started here. Um, if Ms. Miller is able to join us uh, while we're going, okay. she can. Um, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. This is the January meeting of the uh, City of Cleveland Civilian Police Review Board. Happy New Year, everybody. My name is Mike Hess. I'm the board chairman. I'm going to go down the list here um, by way of introduction and also checking on our uh, equipment here. So if you hear your name, uh, please just give an affirmative or a hello. Uh, so I will start with board member Billy Sharp. Here, happy new year. Happy new year. Uh, board member Ken Mountcastle. Here. Board member Sherelle Hardy. Here, good morning everyone. Happy new year. Morning. Uh, board member Brandon Brown. Here. Board member Chenoa Miller. Here. Morning. Uh, and Vice Chairman David Gatton. Here. Okay. Morning, everybody. Um, did anybody have a chance to take a look at the minutes from our previous meeting? Yes. Okay. Um, did anybody see any issues with that? Or if not, does anybody like to make a motion to? Uh, approve the minutes as written. I make a motion. I, Billy Sharp, make a motion to approve the minutes as written. Okay, we have a second. Second from Ms. Hardy. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, that motion will carry. Uh, okay, so we're going to move on to the public comment in a second. Uh, I did want to point out that board member uh, Roz Corto has decided to resign from the board. Um, so that means we're going to be one member down as the mayor's office works to find a replacement. Um, I think Roz was just kind of getting um, caught up with some work stuff and just found that this was no longer the uh, most effective use of her time to serve this community. So, um, I do want to just express my thanks to to Roz when uh, you know she joined the board shortly before I did, and that was a period of great transition for us. Um, and Roz served as the chairman for a few years, and during that time, I think that the the board really kind of transformed into a much more efficient and effective organization. So, Roz, if you're watching. Um, or if you, this message makes its way to you, thank you for your service to the board in the city of Cleveland. Um, okay, so public comment section, John, do you know if we have anybody uh, 
who's in the meeting for public comment. <coughs> You're muted again. Yeah, sorry about that. Good morning, everybody. My name is John Kundick. I'm the new interim administrator for OPS. Uh, just for the record, the time is now 9.09 a.m. Uh, we do have, uh, I believe, two people present for public comment. One is not identified, but I do have Ms. Gouldsby. Would you like to hear from her first? Uh, sure, go ahead. So as far as the public comment goes, because I know we had uh, some individuals who were here to, um, because they had a pending case. Correct. So just just as as a way of explanation here, the public comment section is is not the time for you to speak about your case. Um, this is just uh, for people who wanted to come and generally comment on the uh, policies or procedures of the board. Um, so we can go ahead and do that. I would ask commenters to try to limit your comments to about three minutes, please, so we can keep things moving. Ms. Gouldsby, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Ms. Gouldsby, it's time for the public comment period of our meeting. Uh, you have three minutes. Oh, thank you. Um, this is really a, a recap of the previous questions that I've asked pr prior. Um, just wanted to know if there was an update on the manual, if the manual has been completed, if it's ready for distribution. And also, um, now that the new members of the Community Police Commission have been seated, um, will you all, is there a meeting plan for this board to meet with the new com uh, Community Police Commission members? Uh, to my knowledge, there has not been a meeting planned. Um, as far as the manual goes, I believe that the manual is currently in the city law department's hands. Um, I, I think they have close to a final draft that they're hoping to present back to the court soon. Thank you. Yep. Okay, John, anyone else? Uh, one moment. Go ahead. Is there uh, somebody who called in uh, that could identify themselves, please? My name is Chanel McDougal. Okay. Okay, Ms. McDougal, uh, um, you're here on a case. You'll you'll have an opportunity to speak once we present the case, okay? You can hear me though, okay. right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, I don't believe I have anybody else for public comment. So I believe we're ready to move forward. Okay. Um, new business is the next section on the agenda. I think for the first time in quite a while, not sure that we actually have anything that needs to be discussed there. John, are you aware of anything that we should cover here? For the, no, not for this one. Okay. okay. Um, well, then I think if everybody's ready, we're uh, prepared to get into the investigations. Okay, very good. Uh, we do have uh, a few complainants present who uh, would like to comment at the appropriate time. Uh, yeah. The first one on your docket is number four, case 22-180, Investigator Richardson. Yes, good morning. This is OPS case number 22-0180, where the complainant is Clarice Hall. The date of the incident was July 23rd of 2022. It was filed with the Office of Professional Standards on July 25th of 2022. There is one allegation of unprofessional behavior. The officers involved were Patrol Officer Taylor Payne, badge number 900, and Patrol Officer Andrea Renshaw, badge number 413. A brief synopsis. The Office of Professional Standards received a complaint from Clarice Hall. She stated that two female officers came to her home and asked to talk to her about a package that was for her, but was delivered to the next door neighbor. The officers were invited inside the complainant's home. Once inside, the complainant reported that the officers accused her of having packages delivered to the wrong address. The complainant stated that the package that the officers had contained her address, so the complainant didn't understand how the officers could allege that she was having packages sent to the wrong address. 
The complainant further stated that the office threatened to issue her $150 citation if she goes over to the neighbor's property again. Uh, the complainant reported that the officer said they watched a video of the complainant going on to the neighbor's property, which the complainant denied doing. Um, the Office of Professional Standards recommends that this uh, allegation be deemed exonerated. The rationale for that is that Patrol Officer Renshaw and Pro Patrol Officer Payne won the scene pursuant to an assignment. The officer's wearable camera system video confirms that upon arrival, the officers first interviewed the complainant's neighbors. The neighbors were captured informing the officers that they had several instances when the complainant's items or packages had been delivered to their address. They also alleged that the complainant had been on their property several times without permission. The neighbors showed the officers a cell phone video that purported to show the complainant on their property cutting their grass. After speaking with the complainant's neighbors, the officers went to the complainant's home. They knocked on the door and informed her that they were the C they were CDP officers and they had a package for her that had been delivered next door. The officers were invited inside the complainant's home. While inside, the officers gave the complainant her package. The complainant denied going into the neighbor's property and didn't understand how her packages, which were addressed to her, were delivered to the wrong address. The officer then advised the complainant that there had been several calls for police assistance in connection with neighbor or civil issues. The officers informed the complaint that her address had been flagged and that any future calls related to neighbor or civil disputes may result in a citation that carries a $150 fine. These actions did not violate any established CDP policy or training directive. The officers received the assignment and were duty bound to follow up. The officers asked the appropriate questions for this type of encounter and the issues that were presented. They delivered the complaint's property and advised her of the possible consequences for continued call for police assistance regarding neighbor, neighbor or civil issues. Therefore, the recorded statements in the CDP report establishes by preponderance of the evidence that the alleged conduct did occur, but was consistent with law and policy, and therefore OPS recommends that this allegation be uh, exonerated. Okay, thanks, Mr. Richardson. Uh, anybody have any questions for the investigator so far? All right, and uh, we have Miss Hall online with us this morning. Is that correct? Okay, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and give you an opportunity here to speak about your case. So just by way of a little background for us, uh, oh, all okay. the board members. Sorry, I said okay. Okay, um, all of the board members have have received a uh, case file that includes. Um, you know, case reports, any documents associated with the case, and also any uh, WCS video, which I think both the officers had a, a wearable camera on that day. Um, so we've got, you know, the the presentation that Mr. Richardson just gave is kind of a a summary uh, of his report, but we have a we have a much fuller report with most of the information on the case. Um, so with that said, we're going to give you about three minutes here. Uh, if there's any details that you'd like us to be aware of, you can go ahead and let us know now. Okay. Yes. Can I go? Yeah. Okay. My name is Clarice Hall. On July 22nd, I got a package delivered from GoPro. I didn't know that they made a mistake and went over there. I thought they played a game, but I called them. They re-delivered the package. Okay. The next morning, Tyrell sent that lady, I don't know her name, that cop lady over to her home, which the lady stated, if you listen, she stated that she personally knows this lady and that the stuff that the lady is saying to us is not making sense. How can we orchestrate a delivery person to stop at this lady's home and deliver a package that says our name and our address? This lady wrote up a report, her, Tyrell, Miss Green, they all orchestrated this to have charges placed on my daughter for a criminal mischief about a misdelivered package. When the cop came in here, if, if y'all showed the evidence of the, the bag that she had, it shows the name, it shows the phone number. You could have called, verified that this was they fought, that they made the mistake, not us. The property that she's saying is hers. The lady do not own any property. This lady is going by because she knows this lady and she's taking her side. And that's what made me feel like I don't trust the justice system anymore because they all orchestrated this whole incident over you don't like someone. 
a cop. You know someone, you coming out to their house, accusing them of things that they did not do when the evidence is right here. The address is on the package. The number you can call, they would say, it's our fault. We made the mistake. We don't have anything to do with any of these things. From day one, this Miss Tyrell, she knew them. She got another lady, y'all, one of y'all Cleveland investigators, to all orchestrate stuff. Did she, did she go out? I think so. I can't hear her anymore either. Okay. John, do you think we can? Was she? Did she call in, or was she online? Muted. Um, you're muted. Sorry, I was out there watching videos. Oh, How you don't see who put the package on the porch? I, Can I, I think, keep going? Or we, I think we should probably inform her that we missed some of what she said. Yeah, I'm not oh. sure exactly what happened there, but we we. Your audio cut out, uh, Miss Hall, for whatever reason, for the last like minute or so. Let's go oh. back. Okay. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes. What I'm trying to say is that Tyrell, I don't know the cop name. They know each other. They know an investigator. All of them are in cahoots trying to make up things to make like we're bothering this lady. This lady has cameras on her home. If someone's threatening her or doing a criminal mischief, the only cop came out here was that lady who was sent, who I don't know her name, but, you know, I had it recorded with, you know, so I could show proof that what was said. How am I going to get a $100, $50 fine about going on some property that is mine? The lady don't own no property. And the cop, she's going off by because she knows this lady. She's not going off the evidence. Because if it's evidence, I got plenty of evidence to prove what I'm saying. If any of y'all ever had a misdelivered package from Amazon, FedEx, any of them, you cannot call these people and ask these people to pull over in somebody else's yard or deliver your package to them. You cannot do that. You cannot. Why, why would you waste your money and time doing that for what? What are you getting out of it? None of the stuff that ever was said and did never made any sense, but it only makes sense to people that she knows because it's, it's just senseless. The cop. She's telling me they're going to stop coming out. You can look at the get all the papers from when police reports from when I, you know, called the police. I'm not calling no police or nothing like that. That's Tyrell who's calling the police for silly, silly little things about a misdeliver package. Somebody making a mistake, pulling in the wrong driveway. How is that a criminal mischief? That's not no type of crime. The person who's making a mistake, then they should be called in in court. What wrong am I doing? I, I, I never understood it. And all these people in it together, orchestrating to make somebody look like they're doing something, that's against the law. I cannot know you and have you to come in and orchestrate stuff to make it seem like someone else committed a crime that's not committing no type of crime because I don't like them. That This is just kid mess. And like I said, the cop, I feel that the cop did not treat me fairly because she already had her mind set on what she believed. And she believed Tyrell because she personally knows her. Because if a package came to your house, July 22nd, 9 o'clock at night, why 940 on the 23rd, a.m., y'all at the door? This is someone you knew and you waited to send them. You didn't send no cop you didn't know because you knew they was not going to buy this story. That's why you waited to send her because she said, if you listen, I personally know her. I said, oh, okay. So if you personally know her, why would you come out here knowing you're going to take her side? Okay, Ms. That's, Hall. That's not right. Thank you, Ms. Hall. It's been about three minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, board members, do you have any questions for Ms. Hall or any further questions for Investigator Richardson? Um, for Investigator, uh, Investigator Richardson, <clears throat> during your investigation, was there any proven detail that showed that any of the police officers actually knew 
um, the neighbor personally? No, when I interviewed both patrol officer Payne and Renshaw, I asked that question directly. They said they had never met or encountered the neighbors before. Uh, moreover, the event chronology will, de will demonstrate that these officers received this assignment the, uh, and di that directed them to respond to that address. In their off OPS interviews, both officers said they were duty bound to follow that order, that assignment. They could not disregard that site assignment absent a directive from their, their sergeant. So they were duty bound to accept the assignment, respond, and they both said they had never <clears throat> met they had no personal knowledge of the neighbors or ne had never encountered them prior to this. Um, so there was no evidence that they knew them or that they were uh, handpicked for this assignment. They received this assignment. The neighbors made a complaint within the district as well as called and the event chronology will show that uh, they, the uh, officers were dispatched to the address to respond to a, a civil disturbance neighbor issue. Thank you. I have a question for Investigator Richardson. Yes, sir. The um, the uh, video that was alluded to of the trespassing, did an officer confirm that that video exists? Right, and you'll see them viewing the uh, the video on their wearable camera systems off of the neighbor's cell phone. However, they did not uh, really get into that issue and the um statement regarding a possible fine had nothing to do with a possible trespass or coming onto the property that was based upon the repeated calls that had been noted for civil uh neighbor disputes between the two neighbors and so they were advised that the addresses had been flagged and any any future calls could result in a citation that carried a 150 dollars fine but that had no direct uh bearing on any possible trespass issue at all and and so the last statement you made, that was just the officer informing her that if she continued to call, there may be a fine applied. Based that on she may be cited, comment. correct, that she may be cited and that citation carried a $150 fine. And in response to that, the complaint is captured on WCS just responding, okay. All right, thank you. You're, you're welcome. Okay, anybody else? Okay, does anybody have a motion they'd like to make? Okay, um, hearing none, I will get started. So, uh, I'm gonna start with Officer Payne, uh, badge 900, uh, on the allegation of unprofessional conduct. My motion is going to be for exonerated. Uh, preponderance of evidence which includes WCS footage of the encounter, uh, statements made by the complainant and subject officers, indicates that the alleged conduct, uh, which was to inform the complainant um, generally that she should not be trespassing on the neighbor's property and that further calls for known civil matters could result in a fine for her uh, did occur. That encounter was consistent with manual rules 3.02 and 4.18. Um, because they have a they have a duty not to engage in civil matters in that way. They just have to inform um, the complainant that it's not something that the police can handle. So the motion is to exonerate. Second. Okay, second from Ms. Miller. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. And then as to Officer Renshaw, badge 413, uh, on the allegation of unprofessional conduct, my motion is once again going to be to exonerate. Um, I'm going to reincorporate the same rationale because it was largely part of the same encounter. Um, but the conversation that the officer had with the complainant uh, regarding her rights and uh, and future use of the police system to uh, try to handle a civil matter um, did occur, but it was all consistent with manual rules 3.02 and 4.18. Second. Second from Ms. Miller. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries. And I think that will cover it. 
Um, John, did we have somebody else here in person? Yes. Um, <clears throat> that would be case uh, number five. 22-031, Investigator Delaney. Good morning. Morning. Um, as noted, this is OPS case number 22-0031. The complainant's name is Chanel McDougall. Uh, the date of incident was January, January 28th of 2022, and it was received by OPS on February 1st of 2022. The subject officer's names are Detective Owen Norman, badge number 668, and Heather Mitch. Um, I just wanted to point out that during the time frame of this complaint, uh, um, Heather Mitch was, her rank was as a lieutenant, badge number 8544. However, she has since been promoted to captain, badge number 6585. Um, since the allegations in this complaint occurred during her during the time frame that her rank was as a lieutenant, I'm going to refer to her as a lieutenant uh, during the summary of this investigation. So on February 1st of 2022, the Office of Professional Standards received a complaint from Chanel McDougall. She stated that she believed that the detectives assigned to investigate her report regarding her daughter treated her disrespect disrespectively by not believing her and not fully listening to her during her interview with them. She stated that the interview was not conducted in a private area, but instead was conducted in the lobby area of their department, during which time several officers walked by when she was sharing sensitive photos of her daughter with them. She stated that despite the information that she shared with them regarding her concerns about her three-year-old daughter, they could not provide her information about the status of their investigation or any investigative steps moving forward. OPS recommended, investigated three allegations, and makes the following recommendations. Allegation A, lack of service, unfounded. Allegation B, unprofessional behavior, unfounded. And an additional allegation C of a WCS violation sustained. In regard to allegation A, a lack of service, and allegation B, unprofessional behavior, OPS's investigation revealed the following. The fact pattern for this case establishes that Detective Norman was acting in accordance with his duties as a detective. When Ms. McDougall met with Detective Norman on January 28th, he had only been assigned the case for less than two weeks. Prior to their interaction, his work log shows that he had been in phone contact with Ms. McDougall and had been in the process of obtaining the information he needed to initiate the investigation. He had been gathering and reviewing information from several agencies that had relevant and material information to determine how to proceed with this investigation. Uh, the log and the statements further show him receiving and forwarding evidence. Both Detective Norman and Lieutenant Mitch reported that Ms. McDougall arrived unannounced to their unit, and because of that, the only semi-private place to speak to her was inside their lobby. The video footage shows that Detective Norman and Lieutenant Mitch spent 38 minutes with Mr. Ms. McDougall, where she provided evidence and information to them that she believed supported her allegation uh, that her daughter regarding um, the investigation into her daughter. Uh, the footage shows that Detective Norman and Lieutenant Mitch listened to the information that she was providing and explained the investigative process to her. The footage does not show either of them treating her with disrespect or being dismissive of what she was reporting to them or, or that she voiced any objection objection to the location of their meeting. Uh, the preponderance of the evidence establishes that Detective Norman did not fail to provide a service to Ms. McDougall. Instead, the evidence shows that during the time frame of this complaint, he had been conducting an active investigation into the allegation of, of an assault of Ms. McDougall's daughter in accordance with CDB policy and advised her accordingly about the investigative process. Due to this, OPS recommends that allegation A, lack of service, be unfounded against Detective Norman. Additionally, because the preponderance of the evidence fails to support a finding that Detective Norman or Lieutenant Mitch treated Ms. McDougall unprofessionally, OPS recommends that allegation B, unprofessional behavior, be unfounded. In regard to the additional allegation C, a WCS violation, OPS investigation revealed that Lieutenant Mitch did not activate her camera during her interaction with the complainant on, on February, I'm sorry, on January 28th. Um, this is a violation of General Police Order 4.06.04 that requires that uh, um, investigative 
interviews be recorded on an officer's WCS. And because the preponderance of the evidence shows that Lieutenant Mitch failed to do so, uh, OPS recommends that this allegation be sustained. Okay, thanks, Ms. Delaney. Uh, mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions about that investigation? All right, um, hearing none. Um, Ms. McDougal, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, once again, the board members have received a case file. Um, so we have we have a lot more information that, than just what was provided by Mr. Laney summary there. Um, but if there's anything you'd like to add, we'll give you about three minutes here um, to speak your piece of the board. So you can go ahead when you're ready. Okay. Okay. My daughter is named Nubia McDougal. She is now four years old. At the time, she was three. She had been reporting to me that her vagina has been hurting um, since she was two years old, saying BB, her poom poom. Uh, she finally told me that she had been sexually assaulted on January 16th when her, her father brought her to my home for the weekend and she spent the weekend. I was supposed to return her and I, she had always had marks and scars on, my, on her body and I asked her several times, but she never told me what had been going on, even though I could tell she was being abused and I've been making reports to Children's Services for over a year. Um, when she told me, I contacted the police department, they came out and I took my daughter to the hospital. And the next day after I took her to the hospital, she told me her father had been into the bathtub with her and AJ. And then I called the police again. And that's when she told me they had gave her brown pills and had her smoke black and mild. I called the police in Cleveland. Cleveland police told me to call Columbus police. And then miss, they still gave my daughter back to her father. When I came to Cleveland to talk to the detectives, he was rude the whole time. He kept saying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and cutting me off and was not listening. He had me show, my daughter, I have naked pictures of my daughter's body, but she has bruises and scars all over her. I had to show those pictures in the lobby in front of everyone. He knew I was coming because I had been in contact with him since I found out that there was an investigation opened up in Cleveland. So him saying I popped up unannounced was not true. I had already been in contact with him. I had already forwarded him information. And I told him I was coming to Cleveland because we had a court date on the same day via Zoom. And I came to Cleveland in a snowstorm because I wanted to show him all the pictures that I had of my daughter. He refused after I told him everything that she said, that they make her stick their candy bar in her mouth and make her drink the white stuff, that they put her their candy bar inside of her poom poom and that she bleeds out of her poom poom. He refused to do a safety and welfare check on my child. I came back to Columbus and then after all this occurred, my daughter came to Children's Services in Columbus with bloodstained underwear on February 18th. There has never been an investigation for the sexual assault on my daughter. She's never had any STD checks. She's never been interviewed by forensics um, examination person. I have never been formally interviewed. Her father has a history of pedophilia. He had a baby with his girlfriend's daughter when he was 37 years old and she was 16. He raped his sister when he was 16 and she was 12 years old and no one is listening to me. Their family has a history of incest back to six generations. And the same man that took his sister's virginity when she was 11 is raping my daughter named Uncle Art. She's named over 14 different people from Columbus, Ohio and Cleveland, men, women, and different children that are abusing her. And I talked to her on the day before Thanksgiving. And she said again, that people are still hurting her. And she tells her teacher all the time, a hundred times and she doesn't do anything and nobody listens to her. She needs help. I've contacted so many different agencies. And after this interview, I was going to get everyone's information and forward this to the FBI because my daughter needs help. This is sad and I do not know what else to do. This is just now a year that I've been even in. Someone has followed up and contacted me back about this. Okay. Um, thank you, Mrs. McDougall. I'm sorry to hear all that. Uh, board members, do we have any questions for the complainant? I think I have a question for Detective um, Delaney. Um, hearing the complainants, um, um, I don't want to say speech, but just her overall perspective on things, I would say, is she saying that the primary officer that she worked with 
was um, P.O. Norman? And if so, is she like explaining that um, when she first called him out or tried doing the first police report with them and he told her to go to Columbus police or in a dismissive way, do we have WCS footage of that encounter? Or is this a different encounter with a pol different police officer? I believe, no, it's, um, this case was assigned to Detective Norman. And I believe that prior to the con the, the physical contact on January 28th, there was uh, maybe one or two phone calls between them. Um, but there is footage of the January 28th interaction. It was a 30 mate, 38 minute interaction between Detective Norman, Lieutenant Mitch, and Ms. McDougal. So, uh, Ms. Delaney, I, I think a, a lot of this kind of hinges on the, the fact that the investigation is, or I guess the, the allegation is sort of split between Cleveland and Columbus. Is that correct? I believe that. That these allegations were first identified. Both Ms. McDougal and uh, the father of her child uh, were both residing in Columbus. And the initial investigation was started with uh, um, with Columbus Police and um, Franklin County Social Services. Uh, during the time frame of this complaint, um, I believe it was in July of 2020 or 2021, Miss uh, McDougal's daughter uh, was in the custody of her father, and they moved to Cleveland. And uh, as she. I, um, stated in uh, during this presentation, um, she had some concerns about what was occurring with her daughter uh, between her daughter and her father and some of his relatives in Cleveland, which is what prompted her to file a police report in Cleveland. And it was also aligned with, with uh, Cuyahoga County Children's Services. So during the time frame of this, this of her report and her interaction with, with Detective Norman, he had just been assigned the case. And uh, I noted in my report, he had solicited and requested all the documentation from Columbus Police and Franklin Children's Services. And during the time frame that he met with Ms. McDougal, he was in the process of reviewing several thousand pages of, of information and evidence that was forwarded to him. So um, he, you know, was was attempting to answer her questions, but was still trying to gather information uh, about the evidence that he received as far as how to to advance forward and move forward with the investigation. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Does anybody yeah. else? Yeah, go ahead. Was yeah, the wellness check ever conducted? There was a wellness check conducted on, if you note in the report, mm -hmm. uh, let me get the exact date. There was one conducted on January 27th. Officers attempted to responded to um, the home of uh, her daughter's father, and there was no answer at the door. Was there a follow up after that? That I'm unaware of. So, so I, I have a question that mm -hmm. that um, kind of kind of relates. Uh, so, just to be clear, are are we in our decision making um, kind of bound to the complaint as it pertains to this specific interaction on January twenty eighth in the police station, or are is this a, a larger inquiry into the overall service as it relates to this? Uh, incident um or investigation as a whole uh I'm, I'm a little unclear about whether or not we're limited to this interaction on january 28th my investigation um was in regard to the specific interaction um if you note on the investigative report um, i received this complaint on february 1st and i concluded it on may 9th the information that is included in my report is what was um the status of the investigation at that point. Um, during, uh, 
if you refer to Detective Norman's interview um, during this time frame, he had forwarded there was a, um, a, a sexual assault uh, examination done at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and that had been forwarded to the medical examiner's office for review, and that was what was recurring during the time frame of this complaint. He, it was pending um, additional evidence from the medical examiner's office as far as um, any DNA evidence. So I don't know what has occurred as in regard to Detective Norman's investigation since May of 2022. So, Ms. Delaney, it's it's fair to say that the uh, I guess your your report uh, covers the investigation up to the the time of the complaint, right? So any any like kind Correct. of initial she steps identified in her written complaint that she had these allegations of a lack of service and unprofessional conduct against Detective Norman and Lieutenant Mitch during this January 28th of 2022 encounter. So that was essentially the focus of my investigation. And I also wanted to provide the board with um, a, an update at, at the conclusion of, this, of OPS's investigation as to what the status was of the of Detective Norman's investigation during this, this time frame. Um, it kind of seems that due to the limitation of the investigation only being the incident on the 28th, um, are we, I kind of want to get just an agreement. Are we only, um, are these specific, uh, classifications of, you know, lack of service unprofessional behavior only going to be limited to that incident? Because, um, the comments that were made by the complainant was a synopsis of the entire incident or the entire investigation with CPD. So if the investigation only mainly focuses on the 28th incident within the police department and labeling that unprofessional behavior, then I think that's something that we need to all solidify right now, or we need to, I guess, go beyond that scope of her complaining about the entire investigative process. So what will we be doing? Because I just need a little bit more clarity on that. Are we all agreeing that we're limited to the January 28th incident and that's it? Again, I, I think that was kind of the core of the complaint. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Delaney, but it, it's not it's not that we didn't. You, you looked at the investigation and, and made sure that that was being followed up more or less in accordance with the detective's manual. Is that yes, up to um, the like date I said, that it occurred? My investigation. Uh, was initiated on February 1st and I concluded OPS's investigation on May 9th. So the my investigative report, the status of the that investigation as of May 9th was what was identified in my my report. Yeah, which so was that... that the the sexual assault ex exam had been forwarded to the medical examiner's office for uh for review and for possible DNA evidence and the detective was waiting on that evidence to be returned to him. And yeah. he noted that, um, let's see, I interviewed him in March. He said it could take up to three months to receive the results of that, uh, that evidence from the medical examiner's office. So. So I, I think that the, um, the idea that the investigation wasn't being handled properly or wasn't being followed up properly is is rolled up into the lack of service allegation. So I'd like to continue with Mr. Miller's line of questioning. Um, as, as of right now, do we know the status of the investigation of, of these allegations? Because I think in my mind that one knock on the door and no answer hopefully is not the extent of 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 our outreach. So I'd like to know if possible, do we know what the status of the investigation is now so we can ensure as as we make a decision on what's in front of us, but at least that the, investi the investigation is continuing? I'm unaware of the current status, just up through, like I said, the May 9th submission of this report. Well, I, th I think um, I'm, I'm just a little uncomfortable with these type of serious allegations. Um, uh, as Mr. Hess said, some of some of these things wrap into the entire case as far as lack of service. And I certainly would say if we went and knocked on the door only one time, 
um, to follow up on these kind of allegations would definitely be to me like a service. I I think that it, it and I think this is why we're kind of harping on the what's exactly the scope of of this complaint because if the scope of the complaint is the overall investigation, then I think that we need to have more information about the overall investigation and the fact that the complaint was filed on one date and, and correct me if I'm wrong because I could very well be wrong on this. I don't know if that provides a cutoff to when we can investigate if the investigation is uh, when we can investigate if the original investigation is still ongoing if that makes sense i'd like to have if we are evaluating lack of service for the entirety of the investigation then we need to have more information beyond may 1st if we are not evaluating that if we are only evaluating january 28th um then obviously that's different um but i think we need to decide on that and I, i'm not sure that the investigation up to May 1st to me is adequate. I think that either we're ruling on the entirety of the investigation or we're just ruling on January 28th. It doesn't seem, I don't see the logic behind us on, ruling only upon the investigation up until May 1st. And I do understand investigator Delaney that that's when your investigation concluded. Um, but I think for the sake of us making a decision, it makes the most sense to either make a decision on the entire investigation or just on that interaction not what seems to be a more or less an arbitrary median point. But but also, Mr. Brown, I would I would add that um, what was the intent of the complainant was was her intent just because she filed it on that day to your point was her intent to uh, encompass the whole investigation or what just happened on her interaction on that day. I think that question needs to be answered too. what was her intent. I would have to say I completely agree with both Mr. Brown and also Mr. Sharp um, at no point in the report does it say i'm filing this report on january 28th due to the lack of service that i experienced in the police department you know so i think not only providing a little bit more clarity um, from the complainant and then having that navigate our investigation and then that you know leading to us having a ruling on the certain incidents that took place and i would just say that out of a out of a, an abundance of caution given the seriousness of these allegations. We don't want to look like we're not doing what we're supposed to do. So the, um, it, it, cause I just, I just pulled up uh, Mrs. McDougall's written complaint. So the, the, I mean, the leading, the leading sentence is, um, is that she wants, uh, she wants somebody to work with her regarding the investigation um, of, of her allegations of abuse. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm just. But, but you would glean from that, you would glean from that her intent is the entire investigation. Then. Yeah. If um, I can uh, inter interject for a second, everybody, yeah. I just wanted to point out that the scope of OPS jurisdictions and a discipline that the CPRB is able to recommend is not limited to what is brought forth by the complainant. Uh, that that scope can be extended based upon uh, facts that are brought to light throughout the course of the OPS investigation. So if this is an investigation that the board would want to expand to get uh, a better sense of the full uh, uh, scope, to use that word again, um, of, of the matter, then that's something that can be done. Um, if I could say something, um, yeah. just for clarity's sake, I, I agree that these are very serious allegations that Ms. McDougall is alleging. And um, I interviewed her on February, uh, February 22nd of 2022. My investigation remained open until May. I did not hear any other, uh, receive any other information from her about um, the complaints regarding Detective Norman's investigation. Uh, that being said, um, that's if, if I would have received additional information from her during the time frame um, that I was working on this investigation, I definitely would have moved forward and continued with that uh, investigation further um, in regard to Detective Norman's investigation and, and any further concerns she might have had. Um, that being said, with these types of investigations, um, is the expectation by the board that 
we wait until the investigations have been concluded before we submit an OPS investigative report? Or do we stop at the point where we've already, where we've obtained the evidence that has been uh, presented, that has been provided to us and investigated by us? Um, I'll just I'll just quickly jump in um, and say that uh, when when I was speaking earlier, I by no means meant that that your investigation was in any way inadequate. And I think that you did, did an excellent job with this investigation process. And I think that the way that you conducted it is probably the, the best way to do it, because I wouldn't want these complaints to be dragged out for as long as investigations go on. Um, I think that uh, given uh, Chris's insight that maybe it's more on us to determine uh, more or less on an ad hoc basis when we would like additional um, an additional investigation be done. Uh, but I wouldn't want to just say that, yeah, we should just wait generally for investigations to completely wrap up before we um, before we take into consideration the complaints that involve that investigation, because I could see that dragging complaints out um, for an extended period of time that uh, would not be productive. Uh, so, I mean, I think, and obviously board members feel free to disagree with me. I think that the way that this investigation was done was was correct um, because you were no longer receiving, you know, more information on a steady basis. Uh, but I think that now that we have received some more information today um, and, uh, you know, looking at the entirety of the case, it may be worth um, taking a new look at it and seeing where the investigation is now uh, before making our recommendations. I, I would certainly agree. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. If I may just just add to somewhat piggyback on what investigator Delaney just outlined and what board member Brown just uh, stated. Um, there's there's never been the policy at OPS that when we receive a complaint that involves a lack of service that has a uh, an ongoing criminal investigation conducted by the city of Cleveland Division of Police, we've never been advised, directed, or ordered to keep suspend our investigation until the totality of that investigation has been conducted and completed. In serious instances like this, we all know that it may take a few years before a person is indicted or perhaps even convicted. And therefore, uh, because we have certain timelines that we have to operate on in terms of the expectations that we complete these cases in a timely manner, I don't know if it's reasonable for us to uh, keep it open until the criminal case has been uh, concluded or the investigation has been concluded so that we can then um, evaluate the totality of the breadth of the investigation conducted by the Cleveland Division of Police. If that is the 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 uh, desire of the board, then of course we need to have that communicated and so that we would know going forward what the policy is. So all investigations of this sort will be conducted in a similar fashion. Um, it also, uh, just so that the citizen uh, rights are not at all abridged, we can also instruct the, the citizen that they can file an additional complaint if there's an ongoing issue that they feel is still uh, a lack of service involved in the investigation. And then that investigation can start anew and then they can examine what has happened perhaps since May until now. And that will provide the board an additional chance to then evaluate that part of the division's actions or lack thereof. However, at this point to subject OPS to uh, the expectation that we keep it open with no former uh, policy that directs us to do so would, would not be uh, fair to our investigative process. But of course, that's the prerogative of the board. And if so, we would just like that policy to be codified in some way so we can have consistency in how we conduct these investigations of, of, of with a similar fact pattern. So let me jump in. So taking in account to what Mr. Richardson just said, and following up on Mr. Brown, I think um, our our um, objective is not to keep it open until the end. I think this process is working uh, uh, fairly fine. It gives us a chance to uh, listen to the evidence that that was in at that time. But I think our uh, mode of thinking is at at the point right now we would like to know where the investigation stands because that would uh, inform our, our decision. And what uh, the, the beginning line that Mr. Mr. Hess read off, I think it is, was the intent of the complainant to, to encompass the entire, the entire investigation. But we would like to know where does it stand right now? 
um, as, as opposed to just the information that we have at hand at this point. Excuse me, hey, Mr. Head, this, this is uh, Mr. Perez. Am I allowed to make a, uh, like ask a question or make a comment in this uh, forum? Uh, I think you should. Probably we should drop hold, my Mark, way yes, let's hold off on that. Let, we should, uh, we should, uh, until you're fully onboarded, we should probably make sure uh, that your comments are limited to the public comment period. Yeah, I would, I would, uh, I would tend okay. to agree. That's fair enough. Fair enough. Thanks. Thanks. Good to hear from you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, my hand is up, Mr. Chair. Yeah, okay, go ahead. I'm okay, sorry. according to the collective bargaining agreement, when we look on page 10M, it says when a citizen complaint is filed more than six months after the date of the alleged event and the complaint could not lead to a criminal charge, the accused bar bargaining unit member may order to be respond to the complaint and the investigation, but shall not subject to discipline action for the complaint. So with that being said, um, we're looking at the charges that was brought when Ms. Uh, McDougal had interaction with the police officer on the day that they came out. Is that correct? Not necessarily. Miss, Miss Hardy, read, read the first sentence of that again. Um, okay, this is from the collective bargaining agreement, page 10M. It says, when, when a citizen complaint is filed more than six months after the date of the alleged event, and the complaint okay. did not lead to a criminal charge. So is this leading to a criminal charge or? It's no, but this probably the not. Complaint was, the complaint was also filed within six months of the incident occurring. So yeah, I think that, that, yeah, so I'm not sure that that would necessarily apply or would be an issue here because the complaint was filed. Even if the investigation is continuing beyond six months, the complaint was already filed. Um, but I do think that you bring up a good point um, that goes to investigator Richardson's point um, about uh having the um the complainant file another complaint because that could potentially be an issue for the complainant filing an additional complaint later um if it's more than six months after the original um inciting incident uh, but i think in this case we we're, we don't really have to worry about that because she filed the complaint um almost immediately after the uh, the inciting incident, but also in the middle of the investigation. So, yeah, go ahead, David. Uh, Dave, do you have something to add? Yeah, I mean, uh, notwithstanding the seriousness of the, the, the case that we're being asked to review, um, we, we've been presented a, a complaint uh, that's been investigated by OPS, and, and our initial obligation is to resolve that. Um, that initial complaint, I believe, primarily stems around how the complainant felt she was treated uh, by the officer. Now, in light of her statements here today, um, that complaint seems, in, in my opinion, to have expanded beyond her initial complaint. And it's my understanding that there are uh, numerous ways that any citizen can make a complaint to OPS. Um, it can be walking into the He's frozen for me. Is he frozen for you? Did he freeze up? Yeah. Or was it just me? Oh, okay. Excuse me. We lost him. Mm. Okay. Well, um, well, guess, we're, we're, yeah, just real quick, where, where I think he was going, I, I would, I would simply push back. So let's say, um, like I as indicated before, if, if the, we believe that her intent was the entire investigation, then I would say lack of service would apply if we only went because um, it's our service we're looking at. If we only went and knocked on the door one time and that's it. But since we don't have 
all of the information as of today. We don't know if the officer went back two weeks later and knocked on the door, then that would change my opinion of whether there was lack of service just in that one instance. So I think if we had the most up to date uh, what was going on with the case, I think more influences our decision right now. Is, is the only thing I'm saying. So, for example, if we kicked it to next month and within that time we came back next month, we got an accurate report of what was going on, then that could inform our decision on was it lack of service or not. That's what I'm saying. I agree. And I just wanted to point out again that you're not limited to what the intent of the complainants allegations were the uh, cprb isn't is essentially entitled to file its own complaints so you can look at the issue as it stands right now and require that the a, a invest, investigation continue or that uh, the, the scope of a different complaint be established and then continue investigating that that would be addressed at a later date so so even so even if it, if we didn't believe it was her intent we still have the authority to kick it to another uh a session and get more information in even if it wasn't her intent which i think we most of us believe it was her intent right Correct. right it's it's okay. a matter of whether the facts that resulted from the investigation constitute a complaint or constitute a violation of the uh, GPO. Yeah, I mean, for for instance, even even in this case alone, right? There was no mention, uh, at least a complainant made no mention of the wearable camera system and whether or not it was on. But yet, that is one of the allegations here that was um, suggested to be or recommended to be sustained, right? So Precisely. it's the same idea that as long as we see facts that could potentially lead to. Um, some sort of misconduct and we're allowed to investigate that. Is that a good characterization, Chris? Yes, I think so. So so Mr. Chair, can you can you lead us in, in the way that we we need to proceed here to to try to get this to to where we need to go? Yeah, so pardon me, Mr. Guess, just make sure Mr. Gatton has fallen off the call. Do you still have what you need? Round two, three, four, five. We do. We do have a quorum. Okay. So, okay. Um, so here's here, here's what we got. I mean, we we've either we've either got to vote to table the case and give OPS some instructions on what uh, we need in order to proceed, uh, or we can or we can vote on it and assume that the scope of that the scope sort of is what it is. Um, so I, I would entertain a motion just I, I guess I guess in the motion just explain just make sure that it's clear that OPS understands what they need to add to the case in order for everybody to be comfortable that we have enough information. So like mm -hmm. I, I mean I guess I, I was I was kind of trying to chart out the timeline here. So like in this instance, so Detective Norman received this case in on we signed him on January 19th. Uh, the particular incident we're talking about occurred on January 28th, and then the complaint was filed on February 1st. So if we're going to expand the scope of the complaint beyond the date on which the complaint was filed, I I guess what I'm struggling with is like some somebody's got to find a way to to decide the cutoff. And I don't think it, we should wait until the entire investigation is concluded. Uh, because if we suspect that somebody's doing a less than stellar investigation, I don't think we want that person to continue, you know, a, a major, you know, something that could take years possibly to see through. So um, if anybody has any suggestions on that route, I would like to make a motion to that end. Uh, Mr. Sure. Sharp, you got something? So I can I can struggle through a motion and, and try to get it right. But but okay. what I would say at the end of that, if we um, we um, post or table it until the February meeting, then we make a decision at that time. So so we're, I, I certainly don't agree with keeping this open until the end of the case. I mean, this could go on for years. So um, I, I Billy Sharp make a motion on case two two dash zero. 
31 that we table this case into until our February 14th meeting, giving OPS the direction to get us at that meeting the most up-to-date information on the case. Okay, so the most up-to-date information on the investigation. Investigation, sorry, yes. Okay. Did I do okay? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Second. Um, second from <laughs> Ms. Miller. Uh, okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, I uh, will note for the record that Mr. Gettin uh, seems to be having some technical issues and he was not able to participate in that vote. Uh, otherwise, the uh, motion carries. So, if I may, uh -huh. so essentially what you're asking is for a status update on this investigation? Correct. Yeah. Okay. On, the, on the, the meeting on the 14th of January. I mean, February, sorry. So, uh, do you, does that investigation or this update include, do you want me to interview Detective Norman again? Is that how you'd like me to proceed? I, I think because the, the wearable camera was, was brought in, would, would, would that not be prudent? Or no? Um, as far as the status update on the investigation, no, unless he um, has some additional interviews with um, maybe witnesses or uh, the so, so then I think then, then the answer is yes. Because you bring up a good point. If if between then and now that he, or then at that point he's talked to somebody, you would want to know that. So yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just want to also um, throw out there that I might not be finished with that by February. Um, it depends on the amount of information and evidence that's um, I have to obtain and summarize. So I just wanted to let you know that it might be might be February, but it might be maybe March. But but at the February meeting, you would we would some way be able to know that you're still continuing okay. investigation for what? Okay, that's fine. I can do that. Okay, okay. And thank, then, you. thank you. And then in the February meeting, we would amend it to March if you're not done. Is that okay. how it would work? Mm -hmm. Or could we just amend it to March now since she knows her workload? I think she was. I guess we we kind of we kind of hamstrung ourselves by saying february i guess what we really meant was when it when it's ready to be presented with the most up-to-date information i mean the reality is there's always going to be it's it's not going to be up to the minute right so can somebody simply offer an amendment to that or do i need to say all that again i guess i i don't i don't think it's worth voting on it again i guess if it if it comes up and it's not ready miss delaney we'll just vote to table it again for another month at that time okay, okay. And I, I would like to, Ms. Ms. Delaney, when you uh, made your statement, I would also um, like to know about, you said the uh, Ms. McDougal did not contact you. Can we have information if there was another wellness check? Because I can the first that. one. Okay, thank I can, you. I, I can make that a part of the investigation. Let me write that down. Thank you. Everybody good? Yep. All right. Um, John, I think let's do we have anybody else who's here in person? Thank you, Mrs. McDougal, by the way, for joining us if you're still here. Um, no, I don't believe we have anybody, any other complainants present. So we might as well, we can get started from uh, docket number one. Okay. Dash 176, Investigator Richardson. Yes, good morning. Uh, this is OPS case number 20-0176. Uh, this case was investigated by former OPS investigator Keith Oliver. Um, the complainant's name is Kimberly Gomez. Uh, it was The date of the incident was August 25th of 2020. It was filed with the Office of Professional Standards on August 26th of 2020. There's one allegation of harassment. The officer involved is Patrol Officer Richard Collier, badge number 237. Uh, a brief synopsis, the complainant, Excuse me, I, I hate to interrupt, but I, I just had a note on this case. There were there was no WCS footage in the file, um, which typically have made these almost impossible for us to adjudicate. If that was a situation that I had, um, or if it's not available, or, or where we stand with that. Yes, uh, I, Mr. Gat. 
forward if we can't if we can't move forward without that info. I will address that um, again. This investigation was conducted and completed by former investigator Keith Oliver. Um, I did. Uh, I was made aware recently that there was no WCS uploaded to the OneDrive file that was received by the board. I attempted to obtain that wearable camera system video because it was not uh, included in the IA Pro where it would have ordinarily been linked. Um, again, this was a, a 2020 case, and so mobile support via Sergeant Ball informed me that that, vi that video had reaches delete its retention period and had been deleted. So I was unable to retrieve that and present that to the board. And so here we are, th there's no retrieving it now. And so we have to present it as is because unfortunately, Vescalo Oliver is no longer with the city. He did not upload any wearable camera system video into IA Pro and we have no digital file of that. Again, once I became aware of that, I did request to see if I could obtained it for mobile support, but I received an email from Sergeant Ball indicating that that video had reached its retention period and had been deleted. So it's no retrieving it. So to table it would not benefit the board at all. Uh, so unfortunately we would have to evaluate the evidence as uh, as you've received thus far. Mr. Richardson, yeah. sorry to interrupt. The, the wearable camera uh, a video, was it deleted at the time when this case was open? during during that time period was deleted during the time period it was no it wasn't deleted until uh i believe it reached its retention period in september of, of 2022 was this um, case again, open was this investigation open at that point no i believe he had already uh concluded the investigation and submitted his report because uh that's right around the time that uh he resigned from the city but he had already okay. completed the report, had submitted it, it was just waiting to be heard by the civilian police review board. And in my position as the interim uh, OPS senior investigator, I'm presenting the case because uh, Mr. Oliver is no longer with the office. And so uh, I, I discovered that there was no WCS um, included in the IA profile. And so I attempted to obtain it through mobile support. And that's when I was informed that it had been deleted because it reached its retention period in September of 2022. Yeah, I, I got that. I, the only reason I bring it up because I remember in one of our previous sessions, we we were trying to get it to where um, if if that kind of evidence is in an existing case that it goes to a different holding space, so it's there until until it's ultimately concluded. So you would have been able to have the opportunity to go back and look at it. So my question is, where are we at? And it's not to you. Where are we at in that process to get? material like this move to a different holding pattern until it's completely uh, adjudicated if any if anybody uh, can comment and that's that's a good point mr sharp and i believe that this might have just missed that cutoff when that communication was made to mobile support to, to ensure that any case that ops is investigating is has no retention period and is kept in perpetuity however i believe this missed that uh update uh, that was brought forth by the board and OPS, uh, so that wouldn't happen again. Um, and I think we just missed that update for mobile support, and that's how this fell through the cracks, so to speak. So it, it didn't, it wasn't brought under this new uh, policy that we wanted to develop to retain OPS videos in perpetuity as long as it's identified that OPS investigation is going forward. And uh, in conjunction with that, we had to update the way we label. Uh, the videos in evidence.com so that it alerts mobile support that this is an OPS investigation and so that it should be taken out of any retention period uh, and be kept permanently as as some files currently are. So is that thank, a policy thank now? For that update. Those, will be, those will be kind of flagged, if you will. Now, I, I understand that maybe something else may fall through the cracks during this kind of transition, but is there in fact a policy now that if there is an OPS investigation open, a file should not be deleted. That is my understanding, Mr. Gatton, and, and it's also incumbent upon OPS to make sure it is labeled correctly so mobile support is aware and it, it sends that alert to them that this is OPS because it's labeled as OPS in, in evidence.com. Uh, okay. And so that is my that. understanding, that is the current policy. Okay, I appreciate it. I'm sorry to have kind of slowed this up. No problem, sir. Thank you.
Okay, should I continue? Yeah, I guess we way uh, sidetracked you there, but I do appreciate the update on that. Uh, okay, so a brief synopsis on this case. The complainant, Kimberly Gomez, states that on August 8th, 2020, she called police to her home because she had a conflict with her neighbor. She states that when officers arrived, she spoke with PO Richard Collier, badge number 237. She stated that during this conversation, Patrol Collier questioned her about a previous case in which her house was burglarized. Complainants say that this questioning amounted to harassment uh, by Patrol Officer Collier. The Office of Professional Standards is recommending that this allegation of harassment be exonerated. The rationale, the preponderance of the evidence, including wearable camera system footage, LERM, the LERM's incident report, and recorded statements indicated that Patrol Officer Collier did not engage in harassing behavior. Manual of Rules, Section 4. Point one eight states the officer shall investigate all reports of suspected criminal activity that come to their attention, whether by observation, so assignment, or information. Here, Patrol Officer Collier was inquiring about a previous incident of a burglary that both he and the complaint agree he responded to that incident, and that case had remained uns unsolved at that time. And these were reasonable investigative tasks that fell within his investigative duties in accordance with Manual of Rules Section 4.18. Therefore, the allegation of harassment is recommended as exonerated since the officer inquired about previous matters, but the in inquiry was consistent with his duties under Manuel's rules of 4.18. I also want to point out that uh, former investigator Oliver did have communication with the then acting internal affairs superintendent Simon, who stated that there was no policy or procedure that prohibits a patrol officer from following up on a case that has been assigned to a detective. And that was attached as exhibit B to this investigation. Here, patrol officer Collier questioned and complained about a previous case that was still open at the time of the complainant's neighbor dispute. Therefore, Patrol Officer Collier acted within the scope of his duty to investigate in accordance with the Manuals of Rules 4.18, and that's why the Office of Professional Standards recommends that this allegation be exonerated. Okay, thanks, Mr. Richardson. Does anybody have any questions about the investigation? Okay, hearing none, does anybody have any motions they would like to make? I will. Dave, go ahead. Uh, case 20 176, um, starting an allegation against Officer Collier, badge number 237. The allegation of harassment motion will be that this be exonerated. Um, even though we don't have the WCS for uh, reasons stated previously, the <clears throat> statement, the, the information was provided by a previous investigator uh, having a review of the WCS, and there's no real reason to, to question that information, especially when the complainant's uh, written complaint even includes uh, indicating that the officer questioned her about a previous case and, and not much else. So that doesn't seem to be in question that in fact, uh, that's her complaint that he questioned about something, a case previous, um, that that did in fact happen, even if we can't see it on the WCS. Um, the uh, manual rules section 4.18 indicate that it, it is uh, reasonable for an officer to uh, question a previous case that there is no uh, rationale that can be provided that indicates that this was harassing behavior by the officer to question a previous case. Um, therefore, my motion will be for exonerated. Second. Second. Okay, second from Ms. Hardy. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, and uh, motion carries. Okay, thanks, Mr. Richardson. Um, Thank you. John, what do we have next? Next is uh, docket item number two, case 20-276, Investigator Richardson again. Again, this is OPS case number 20-0276, where the complainant is Heather Paulus. Again, this investigation was conducted by former OPS investigator Keith Oliver. The date of the incident was December 26th of 2020. It was filed with the Office of Professional Standards on December 30th of 2020. 
there are two allegations, allegation A, an improper search, and allegation B, damaged property. The officers involved are Sergeant Mark Blaine, badge number 9222, and Sergeant Dane Sappho, Dana Sappho, badge number 9107. Uh, brief synopsis, uh, the officers of the Office of Professional Standards received a complaint from Heather Paulus. She stated that on 12 26 2020, members of the CDP SWAT unit came to her house and destroyed it. There were holes in her ceiling, items flipped over, and, a, and doors and a TV were broken. Um, as relates to allegation A, the Office of Professional Standards recommends that allegation be deemed unfounded, that allegation being improper search. The rationale, the recorded statements and the event chronology establishes by a preponderance of the evidence that the alleged conduct did not occur. And therefore the Office of Professional Standards recommends that allegation A, improper search be deemed unfounded. As relates to allegation B, damaged property, um, investigator, former investigator Oliver somewhat bifurcated the damaged property issues, um, one examining the damage that occurred to the ceiling and the disarray of the bedroom. Um, the recorded statements and the event chronology established by opponents of the evidence that, that the alleged conduct did occur, but was consistent with policy. And therefore, the Office of Professional Standards recommends the allegation B as relates to the damage to the ceiling and the bedroom be exonerated. The recorded statements and event chronology fails to establish by proponents of the evidence if the alleged conduct did or did not occur as relates to the damage to the television and any doors. And therefore, that for that part of the damaged property allegation, which is uh, allegation B, the Office of Professional Standards recommends that that allegation be deemed insufficient evidence. And, and that's because of the bifurcation that uh, and former investigator Keith Oliver did for a lot to provide clarity as to those issues that both involve the damaged property. Okay, got it. So, uh, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Richardson? Ms. Hardy? Yes, Mr. Richardson, I have a question. So, this incident occurred on December the 26th, 2020. Um, and it says SWAT unit members have not been issued WCS cameras, wearable camera systems. Therefore, there is no independent evidence. So uh, this was in 2020. Is there any consideration that the special weapon tactics unit SWAT be given wearable cameras? Do we know of that or? I'm not sure. I would have to have to check with mobile support to see if there's been an update to that if they've issued uh wearable camera systems to SWAT as of today. Um, but but back then in 2020, SWAT members did not, had not been issued wearable camera systems due to the functions of, of their duties. Okay, and, and I know we've heard that before, the function of their duties, uh, but when they're inside a home like that, I believe that we need that information um, because property is valuable. And also, if if not, how can we, um, make a suggestion or recommendation um, that they wear cameras inside of a home when they're destroying it or looking for drugs or whatever. I, I think, was this in, did you say this was in 2020, Mr. Richardson? Correct. Correct. Yeah, I, I think that it might have been updated since then because I know there were a lot of, there were a lot of units that had a, uh, a slow rollout of the body cams. Like I know the, um, like the vice units um, were some of the last to get them. So I think before we uh, make any considerations about the policy, I think we should double check and make sure that that's not a requirement now, because I think as the city has been able to acquire more equipment for that, um, it's it's pretty ubiquitous. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure if that applies to the SWAT team or not, but I think we should find out before we Jumps in. We, we, we certainly, we certainly can. I, I'm, I'm almost certain that they, they have now been issued wearable camera system videos, but I don't want to comment on that in a definitive way because I didn't look at that for this because the time period of relevance for this case would have been the status of their cameras in on December 26th of 2020. And at that time, they had not been issued wearable camera system video. Okay, so, thank you. It, it, Do you think it, Oh, go ahead. 
I was just going to say, do you think we could look into that and get an update on that for our next meeting? Absolutely. I'll, I'll send you an email today, uh, Chairman, as, as to the status of the SWAT unit having wearable camera systems issued to them. Okay, thanks. Investigator Richardson, just if you can enlighten me a bit more on specifically the doors and the TV that were uh, allegations were made that they were damaged. How do we verify that they weren't? We could not, and that's why we said insufficient evidence as it relates to the damage to the door and the television. The officers denied damaging the door or the television. Um, the complainant states that they did damage the door or the television. The, the officer stated that the, all doors are open, so they had no need to do that, and they they uh, offered uh, the the opinion that perhaps the television had been damaged in the domestic violence incident that they were responding to, but they denied damaging the uh, door or any television. They acknowledge, it, they acknowledge damaging the, sit, the ceiling in order to install the camera that was used to locate the suspect who was hiding under the insulation in the uh, attic. And they acknowledged causing a disarray to the bedroom in their search for the suspect. However, they denied damaging any television or any door. Again, because SWAT, the SWAT members were not issued wearable camera system video, that's why the report notes that there was no independent evidence to establish how that damage was caused. It's clear that the door, there was damage to a door and a television uh, based upon the, the photos provided by the complainant, but we don't know how that damage was caused. And again, the officers offered perhaps mm -hmm. it, was, it was caused during the domestic violence incident that caused them to be on the scene. And that's why the, the allegations of a damaged prop property were bifurcated to those issues, the damage to the ceiling and the disarray to the bedroom, which we, we uh, exonerated on that because it was consistent with policy that that damage was reasonable uh, to accomplish the goals of the SWAT unit on that day. However, it relates to the damage to the TV and the doors. That's why we recommended in that bifurcated manner that that be deemed insufficient evidence. Because on one hand, we have the allegation by the complainant that the damage was caused by the officers, and we have the denial by the officers that they caused that damage. Mm. All right, thank you. Okay, anybody else have any questions? Does anybody have any motions they'd like to make on the case? Go ahead. Dave, go ahead. Uh, case 0 276. Um, let me, let me just clarify. We have, uh, Sergeant Blaine. And officer Sappho, and then we have. Uh, two allegations, uh, 1 regarding damage to this to the split. These are against both of those. Uh, Officers, correct? That is correct, Mr. Gatton. Both allegation A, improper search, and allegation B, uh, damaged okay. property, are against both sergeants who were in charge of the scene that day. Appreciate it. I'll start with Sergeant Blaine, badge number 9222, uh, regarding improper search. Um, <clears throat> they received a call regarding a gunshot. Um, they investigated, identified there were no footprints that identified anybody had left the house. So there was uh, clear rationale by them to expect that the suspect was on site. Um, there were exigent, exigent circumstances um, because of a serious offense and perhaps uh, somebody on site uh, with uh, a gun that had shot the gun. Um, so in terms of the improper search, the search was consistent with GPO 2.02.02. 2. 02. Uh, they can conduct a warrantless search if exigent circumstances are present. So uh, by motion regarding officer or Sergeant Blaine uh, regarding improper search is that that is unfounded. Okay, motion is for unfounded. Do we have a second? Second from, I think, Mr. Brown. Um, make sure you unmute your mic. Yeah, sorry. Yes, second. second. Uh, all right, all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Dave, you want to keep going? Yes. Uh, okay. In case Officer Sappho 
batch number 9107, allegation of improper search for the same rationale I just stated uh, previously regarding uh, Sergeant Blaine. Um, my motion for this will be that that also be unfounded. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Uh, I'll continue on. Same same case. Uh, regarding allegation, and, and I'll split these into uh, two as was done by uh, OPS. Uh, first, we have uh, an allegation of damaged property regarding the ceiling. Um, regarding, uh, so let's look at Sergeant Blaine, badge number 9222. I'm going to uh, motion that uh, the damage to the ceiling not be misconduct, that this be um, exonerated. Uh, they did, in fact, uh, cut a hole in the ceiling. There was damage to the ceiling, but it was consistent with swap practices. Um, they were looking for a subject. They had, um, I believe they were provided some information that he might be in the attic or he was hiding in the attic. Um, so they cut a hole, they sent a drone up and in fact did find the suspect up there. So there was nothing that was done uh, improperly. Um, so my motion will be that that allegation regarding Sergeant Blaine be exonerated. Second. Okay, all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Regarding Sergeant or Officer Sappho, badge number 9107, the same allegation of a damaged property to the ceiling uh, for the rationale previously stated. My motion will be that that also be exonerated. We have a second. Second. Sorry. Second from Mr. Brown. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Motion carries. Same. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, a separate or a different damaged property allegation um, against Sergeant Blaine, badge number 9222. This is the one for the TV and the door. Um, because there were no wearable cameras, um, at that time, uh, required by SWAT personnel to be wearing, um, we have a um, word versus word type thing. There's no evidence uh, that shows that it was or was not done by the SWAT unit. So we insufficient evidence. So my motion uh, on the second damage TV and door regarding Sergeant Blaine will be insufficient evidence. Second. Okay, just, all those. just a question real quick. That is not on the sheet, correct? This one that we're going over. Mm, this, this, that this, was, that was, so, so it was presented as uh, damaged property and OPS split this into two different things. There was damage uh -huh. killing that was exonerated. Uh, uh -huh. SWAT admits they did that, and it was proper, or at least that's what we just ruled. Mm -hmm. There was damage to the TV and to the door, um, which the officers deny, the complainant says happened, um, but we don't have any anything to show whether or not it, it was done by SWAT. Or the so we, just, we split so the your property things. Yeah, the ceiling that's how OPS addresses this. So okay. That's what I'm trying to cover here. Okay, I just because I don't have anywhere to mark it on my sheet. But go ahead. To answer your question, though, I, on the agenda, it's not it's not on the agenda that way. But I'll, I'll second that as well. Okay, uh, the motion has been seconded. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. And I believe this is this wraps it up. The uh, officer Sappho badge. 9107, same case, 20-276. Um, on the damage allegation regarding the TV and the door, uh, for the same rationale previously stated, um, my motion will be that that be insufficient evidence. Second. 
Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries. We got them all? Is that, uh, do we cover everything, Mr. Richardson? Yes, sir. Okay. And I guess we should just note for for the minutes that, that we did split that into, basically we split it into two different damaged property allegations in terms of what our, our um, decision was there. Yeah, I concur, just because the, the, the agenda won't reflect that. Okay, John, what do we have next? Docket number three, case 22-047, Investigator Richardson. Morning, uh, again, this is case number 20-0047 where the complaint is Hayes Rowan. The date of the incident was February 28th of 2022. I mean, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. It was filed with the Office of Touch Standards on February 25th of 2022. There's an allegation of lack of service. The officer involved was Patrol Officer Nathaniel Rodriguez, badge number 1353. A brief synopsis, uh, the Office of Professional Standards received a complaint from Hayes Rowan. He stated that he wanted a review of the officer's response to his address on 2-18-2022. Mr. Rowan said he needed to report ADA Title III service violations and to report signs of sexual predation, gas light lighting, etc. with an office of the executive director of the downtown YMCA. He alleges a lack of service against patrol officer Nathaniel Rodriguez due to officer Rodriguez not filing up making a police report as he requested. The office of professional standards recommends that this allegation be exonerated. The rationale, the recorded statements and the wearable camera system video establishes by preponderance of the evidence that the alleged conduct did occur, but was consistent with policy. And therefore the office of professional standards recommend this allegation of uh, lack of service be deemed exonerated. Okay, thanks. Does anybody have any questions about that investigation? Does anybody have a motion they'd like to make on this case? Okay. Um, so, uh, as to Patrol Officer Rodriguez, page 1353, the allegation of lack of service, uh, I'm going to make a motion for exonerated. Ponderance of evidence, which includes WCS footage of the encounter, statements from the complainant and subject officers, indicates that the alleged conduct, uh, which was a failure to generate a police report based on the contact with the complainant, uh, did occur, but was consistent with manual rule 9.01, as the complainant did not actually articulate a crime uh, that had been committed that would that would warrant the generation of such a report. Second. Okay, second from Ms. Hardy. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Mm. Okay, it was, okay. Uh, so I think that covers it, right, Mr. Richardson? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, All right, John, ready when you are. Yeah, next on the docket, number six, case 22-039, Investigator Delaney. Okay. Case number 22-0039, complainant's name is Joseph Bartell. The date of incident was January 15th of 2022. It was received by OPS on February 10th of 2022. The subject officer's name is Officer Anthony Sato, badge number 107. He's with the first district. On February 10th of 2022, OPS received a complaint from Joseph Bartell. He stated that on January 15th, he was assaulted at the public house and he went to Fairview Hospital to, to receive treatment. He said that when Officer Sato responded to the hospital, he told him that he wanted to press charges. Mr. Bartell stated that Officer Sato handed him his card and then told him to go to the eighth floor of the Justice Center. He said that when he asked Officer Sato if he had obtained any witness statements, he replied, quote, I got it. Mr. Bartell alleged that Officer Sato never took a statement and never went to the public house to obtain witness statements. OPS investigated uh, allegation A, which was a lack of service, 
and uh, the recommendation is that allegation be sustained. OPS's investigation revealed the following. Uh, the uh, CDP manual of rules and regulations 9.01 and divisional notice 15-87 address officers' duties regarding the writing of a, of a report. Policy asserts that the writing of a police report is an essential part of, of an officer's work. The purpose of the report is to document words and actions to assist in the investigation of the reported crime. The policy mandates that officers' reports shall be thorough. In this case, although Officer Sato generated a police report, that contained information about the victim and the suspect and the basic elements of the assault, he did not include any information about witnesses. The WCS footage, footage establishes that he was repeatedly told that there were witnesses available who were willing to speak to him to provide statements of what they had observed. The footage shows that the Bartels explaining to Officer Sato their rationale as to why they believe these statements to be vital in moving forward to pursue charges. The Channel 1 recording establishes that a two-man zone car was available to assist him in obtaining these statements, but that Officer Sato communicated to dispatch that he didn't need these statements. Per Mr. Bartel, he was questioned by the prosecutors about witness statements. Uh, witness statements help to preserve the facts of the case. In this case, since Ms. Mrs. Bartel reported that there were no surveillance cameras in the area where the assault occurred, it's reasonable to conclude that these witness statements could have played a vital, vital role in uncovering further information about the assault to assist in the investigation and prosecution of this case. Um, in conclusion, because the preponderance of the evidence shows that Officer Sato made the, made the decision not to include witness statements in the assault report he generated for Mr. Bartel, despite Mr. Bartel's repeated request to include these statements in the report uh, amounted to a lack of service, OPS recommends that this allegation be sustained. Okay, thanks, Ms. Delaney. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that investigation? Okay. Does anybody have a motion they'd like to make on this case? Okay. Um, all right, so on the uh, allegation of lack of service, as against Patrol Officer Sauto, badge 107, uh, for case 22039. We make a motion to sustain that uh, preponderance of the evidence, which includes WCS footage of uh, the officer's interaction with the victim and the complainant, um, records of the subsequent investigation. Uh, and I guess testimony from the subject officer and the complainants as well uh, indicates that the alleged conduct, which was the failure to uh, adequately prepare a police report. Uh, so while a police report was generated, uh, it didn't contain a lot of pretty critical information, including a lot of the witnesses who had been there uh, at the time of the alleged assault. Um, so the report ultimately was not prepared in a manner that was consistent. Uh, with manual rule 9.01. So that motion is to sustain. We have a second. Second from Mr. Sharp. Okay. Yes. Um, thanks. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Staying yeah. I I uh an acquaintance with somebody named in the investigation. Okay. All right. So one abstention uh, looks like everybody else outside of that was unanimous. So we need to pick a group level. Um, let me look through the matrix here. Um, I think. Um, under group one, there's uh, reports failure to submit or timeliness failure to notify supervisor, uh, unsatisfactory performance, and other similar violations. So I'm going to make a motion that that's a group one uh, violation. Do we have a second for that? Yeah, I'll second that. Second for Mr. Brown. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 
Any opposed? Any abstentions? Mr. Gack will abstain for the reasons stated earlier. Uh, so that motion carries. And uh, I think it covers it for that case as well. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right, docket number seven, 22 068, Investigator Delaney again. Okay, the complainant's name for this case is Sabrina Bryant. Uh, the date of incident was March 16th of 2022. It was received by, uh, by OPS on March 22nd of 2022. Subject officer's name is David Morova, badge number 1117 with the first district. On March 22nd, the Office of Professional Standards received a complaint from Sabrina Bryant. She stated that on March 16th, around 8 p.m., she went to the first district to file a child abuse report. She stated that Officer David Morova came out to the lobby and questioned her in front of everyone as to what she meant by child abuse. She alleged that Officer Morova had an attitude and was rude and disrespectful. Ms. Bryant stated that Officer Morova made actions as if someone was punching someone to determine whether her abuse claims were true. She further stated that he told her that if she wanted a report, she would have to wait since he was the only officer taking reports. OPS investigated the following allegations, allegation of unprofessional behavior with a recommendation of sustained, allegation B, insufficient service, recommendation of exonerated, an additional allegation of a WCS violation with a recommendation of sustained. In regard to uh, allegation A, unprofessional behavior, OPS's investigation revealed the following. Ms. Bryant reported to the district with her young children to report child abuse. Just the sheer nature of the reason that she was requesting a report, coupled with the fact that she was with her young children, should have prompted Officer Morova to approach this family with some sensitivity and discretion. Instead, in the presence of strangers and while hovering over them, Officer Morova asked Ms. Bryant and her son to describe how he had been abused while making punching gestures and using triggering words such as beating and wailing. He also made the comment, you're allowed to beat your kid after Ms. Bryant explained him what had happened to her son. Although Officer Morovitz, Morova stated to OPS that he speaks quickly when interacting with those reporting to the district in an effort to be efficient, he has a duty to ensure that his conduct, speech, and acts with, during these interactions are professional and discreet, especially when interacting with the young children who are reporting crimes of a sensitive nature. Because the preponderance of the evidence shows that Officer Morova's conduct, speech, and acts were in violation of manual rules and regulations 5.01, 5.08, and 5.09, OPS recommends that Allegation A be sustained. In regard to Allegation B, a lack of service, uh, the investigation revealed that just minutes to Ms. Bryant's arrival at the district, two other individuals have reported to the district for police assistance. The lobby footage shows Officer Morova providing assistance in the order that the three of them arrived. He truthfully informed Ms. Bryant that she should that she would have to wait her turn and proceeded to immediately assist the individual who had reported 10 minutes prior to her arrival. In the end, uh, Ms. Bryant opted not to wait for a report to be generated. The preponderance of the evidence shows that Officer Morova verbalized an intention to file a report for Ms. Bryant in accordance with manual rules 9.07 and that Ms. Bryant made the decision not to wait for the report to be completed. Uh, because Officer Morova did not fail to assist Ms. Bryant, OPS recommends that Allegation A, or I'm sorry, Allegation B, a lack of service be exonerated. Um, allegation C, a WS, WCS violation. Um, although brief, Officer Morova's interaction with Ms. Bryant was an investigative contact. His first statement to her, what do you mean by child abuse, was an investigative question. During the remainder of their interaction, he continued to ask her investigative questions until he made a determination that she, need, she needed a report. The division's WCS policy does not distinguish or provide for an exception for these brief investigative contacts. Because the preponderance of the evidence shows that Officer Morova's failure to record his investigative encounter with Ms. Bryant was in violation of General Police Order 4.06.04, OPS recommends that this allegation be sustained. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Delaney. Does anybody have any questions about the investigation? Yeah, you yeah. go ahead, Mr. Guido. This is this in, in, regarding the lobby footage, and we keep bumping up against this again and again. Um, the NFF MVF files, uh, 
that are provided cannot be opened, at least by me, and at least previously, not by others, using the MV player download that's provided by City of Cleveland IT department. So the lobby, lobby footage in that format is not viewable. Uh, Ms. Delaney, I, I saw that you did take a WCS video of your laptop yesterday. I did not have time to <clears throat> do that. But going forward, we need to we need to just we we can't have these lobby footages like viewed from a uh, video camera showing a computer with incredibly poor uh, audio. I, I know in previous cases where we've been able to view the uh, MVF files, audio is poor anyhow. It's a camera sitting somewhere in the room uh, of a lobby. And now we're trying to take a video of a video. So I don't know how we resolve this. I'm not an IT guy, but it just seems like somehow there's got to be a way to be able to play an MVF file, whoever can play it, on their computer and have that recorded in a format that we can view. I don't know if that's an MP4 file or or something else, but Mr. Gatton. feel prepared, especially because this case really revolves around was he unprofessional is what he said and, and did unprofessional uh, we I couldn't see that in the lobby footage and I don't know that did, did anybody was anybody else able to see it using an MVF file oh uh, no the original file didn't that's a weird file um right I haven't found anything and it seems it. like that it seems like that's all the lobby footages are in that format mm -hmm. um the lobby footages are in that format and right. um, so we just need to be able to figure something else out. I don't I, I don't I know that this is an issue that we've been going round and round with. And I know right. that um, during Leanne's tenure with us, um, she was in repeated contact with IT trying to come up with a solution. And in the end, I don't believe there was any solution. But I saw that Eric just came on and he has an update on um, hopefully some improvements in getting this footage to you. What's well, that information, Eric? Well, I'm not sure if this is an update, but what, what we learned through this whole process, as Mr. Gatton has pointed out, it's been a frustration with uh, the Office of Professional Standards as well, because we certainly don't want to have to record, uh, make a recording of the video, the lobby video on our wearable camera system in order for the board to have access to that. But that was the solution offered to us by IT, because at that time, they did not have the technology or the ability or or perhaps willingness to make sure the board has the uh, in a, NF player so that they can view the, the videos as OPS can. They stated that they were in the process of upgrading all the lobby camera, uh, lobby video systems so that they are recorded in the format that the board will be able to view without having any additional technology or installations to their uh, to their computers that they use. And so that's where we are. Uh, again, OPS made every effort uh, in order to rectify the situation. And that's what we were informed to do to record the lobby video onto our wearable camera system, uh, wearable camera system cameras, so that there will be some uh, recording of the lobby video. I, I, we can follow up to see where the Cleveland Division of Police, uh, where they are in that process of updating, because they do know the, the, the lobby camera uh, systems that they use are up, outdated and they want to go to a cloud based system that will also be, make it easier for everyone to view uh, the camera. So that's where we are. We've we've done we've taken the only steps that have been offered and suggested to us, and that is to record them on on your wearable camera system video uh, so that when the lobby video is pertinent to an investigation, we can still have some method that the board can use it, albeit not. Uh, perfect in terms of uh, video audio quality. And we agree with you. It is of poor quality that the current um, uh, footage, you'll note in my report that I um, indicated that several times, it, unable to hear what was being said. So um, hopefully the division will update that soon. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm not, I'm not laying this at the feet of OPS. It's just frustrating. I, I mean, I'm laying at the feet of the, you know, 
city of Cleveland IT department that doesn't have a way to, I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not an IT guy. Uh, I, not I, to belabor it, but it's hilarious to me yeah. that the solution is to change the cameras and not, they don't, yeah. there's no possible way to convert these things to MP4 or something. Right. I, I, I just find it hard to believe that anything that is on my laptop, that I, and I mean, we see, you know, training videos all the time that shows here, click here, click here, everything. There's got to be a way to record what's on my laptop and at least present that. So I, I don't know. It's, it is frustrating. In my opinion, we can't adjudicate the first two allegations of this case without that information. So either we get a, a better recording of it somehow, or I, I think we're, my, my opinion would be we're stuck with insufficient evidence on the, on those two. Now the WCS uh, allegation, I think we could rule on. Sure. Um, I don't know how we want to proceed at this point. Okay, Mr. Sharp. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, uh, to Mr. Mr. R Investigator Richardson's um, report was pretty telling when he got to the part about unwilling to convert. And I think some of that may be a, a part of it, just a headache to move it from one uh, program to another for them. And I would ask Mr. Richardson, Investigator Richardson, if he's still there, in our uh, February meeting, could you bring us an update um, on where they are, even if we don't have a case that, that, that gets that information, but I'd like to hear just from you where they are um, in, uh, in February, if that's okay. Absolutely. I'm sure, uh, interim administrator Kudnick, uh, will greatly assist me with getting that information and finding out, uh, what the status is, uh, on both fronts, the city converting their lobby, uh, camera systems to one that is, uh, accessible by the board and provides greater clarity of both audio and video and, or, is there a more updated solution that will allow us to record or present lobby video in a way that can be viewed and heard by the board? So on both fronts, um, Mr. Kudnick will uh, get yeah, that information will, and we'll get that to you by the February uh, meeting. Right. Yeah. And, and and quickly to, Ms., to Mr. Gatton's point, as long as that video does exist and there's an opportunity that they can convert it, I, I, I hate to table cases, but I'd like to probably um, table this one to see if we can get that in a different format and and really get a listen to the sound or or, or video of what we need to make it to make a determination because I would hate to to do insufficient and and the offense actually occurred if if we still see it's different I would agree if we didn't have the video but we have it and there's an opportunity to get it converted so I I would suggest that we we table this one until we can see if we can have that done. Well. So, Ms. Delaney, you, you viewed the original video, right? Correct. You viewed it on your laptop? Yes, I have the MV player on my laptop. Have you seen what the video of it looks like when the, the video of the laptop, have you reviewed that? I guess my question is, if you had seen what that looks like compared to the original, you could inform us whether there actually is more information because it's you know it's a lobby camera it's not a wcs camera so it's not so you're asking me what i observed on the lobby footage i, I guess i'm asking you for the benefit of the board okay. is is there that much more information in the original video because you're saying there were big parts of it you couldn't hear anyway is there uh, enough information in that video that it's worth waiting a month to try to get like a, a better copy of it the, if that's even possible Per the lobby footage, absolutely, you can see um, Officer Morova approaching uh, Ms. Bryan and her children when they're sitting at the district. You hear, um, if you listen very carefully, um, you can hear, you can hear most of what is said. Um, there's a um, the there's a section where her son is humming, and so that drowns out a lot of the or some of the conversation, I would say. Uh, but you can see um, one of her allegations as far as the unprofessional was that he was mimicking, uh, making punching gestures. And um, so you can actually see that in the uh, lobby footage. Um, so, yes, I, I feel that it. The footage shows quite a bit. Okay. It provides a picture of, of what occurred. In regards yeah. to her allegations of unprofessional conduct. Yeah, so I. I guess, you know, is there is there something if if we watch the video of a video, 
is there something that we're missing that it's worth waiting another another month for because i i tend to agree like a lot of it looking in my opinion honestly the the kind of gestures and and motions and body movements that uh, the officer was making that you can see in the video that sort of corroborates the whole story for me even though maybe you can't hear exactly every single word that he's saying in the in the degraded copy of the video that the board was sent yesterday were you able to hear what was said on the wcs that i sent you can hear it's like it's it's just got like a wavy sound to it, it you know because it's a it's it's a secondary recording right. system yeah right. so, so like it's go ahead it's not perfect i guess but i i right. think that in in my opinion i get the i get the gist of it and since mm -hmm. it matches up with the with the statements but I'll I'll leave that up to you guys to decide. If somebody wants to vote to table it until we can get a clearer copy of the video, which may or may not even be possible because we've asked IT to do this a number of times and they haven't. Um, or we could vote on it now saying that we have enough evidence or we could vote on it now and say insufficient evidence, which I wouldn't recommend, but. In my report, um, in the summary of the lobby footage, um, it denotes exactly what I heard. So um, if I am able to hear it, via the original footage, I believe that's something that you would be able to hear as well. If we can, you know, get it in a different format and get a resolution to this. And and uh, investigator Delaney's uh, report is considered evidence in the case. Yes or no? Because we would use her in in lieu of having the in lieu of us being able to view the camera and and sound, we would take her her report as evidence no yeah i mean what what you need to decide for yourself is that does it you know a preponderance of the evidence right so more more likely than not i guess so a statement from a party is evidence but it's up to you to decide the veracity of that evidence um you know a statement from an uninterested third party witness might be up here a statement from uh an ops investigator I would say that I trust all of the investigators. I don't think anybody is just making stuff up in these reports. Um, and then obviously if you have an actual video of something happening, that's obviously very likely that it occurred the way that the video shows. So that's kind of a personal determination that you need to make, I guess. I mean, OPS investigators are fact finders and the, the summary of the uh, lobby footage are the facts as, um, as presented and observed by me so okay i i just hate to to move forward if if for one of my colleagues the video uh was that important that it, that it would um influence uh uh their determination is is my caution i agree you're right that's uh i agree so is anybody of that mind where they feel like we need to to so Again, like if we don't table it, the options are to find insufficient evidence here um, or to decide that we have enough information to go forward. I, I don't, I don't opinion, think it makes sense to Yeah, I, I guess the first thing we want that is I, I did not view the video sent yesterday. So I would, I would not have that evidence at all for uh -huh. the ability to vote. Notwithstanding okay. that, you know, yeah, uh, I haven't no rationale and no belief whatsoever that Ms. Delaney is making something up here. I believe she is reporting what she saw. That said, um, I believe when we have evidence available as a group, we should say, we want to see that evidence and, and let us take a look at it. Um, I know that, you know, there, there are differing opinions sometimes when we, when we see, especially in cases like this, um, one person might say, yeah, he said, you know, I really can't take a report here or, you know, or, you know, why don't you just sit there and wait? And somebody else might say, man, he really had a bad tone and was unprofessional in how he addressed that person. And we both see and hear the exact same things. So when there's a video, if we could see it, I think we should see it. We should watch it. And and, and maybe it's just a matter of I got to go back and, and watch the video that was provided yesterday. I personally wouldn't feel comfortable voting on the on on it 
without seeing that and and because I think this is it, there is some subjectivity when we take a look at was somebody unprofessional in what they said so, you know okay. we could read a statement and and take somebody's opinion on that but I think we're charged with you know adjudicating those things uh, ourselves okay um, do you want to make a motion I, I guess I would just caution you as you make your motion to make sure that you're mentioned something about asking OPS to try to get an improved quality yeah, version I, of the video. Yeah. Um, We're going to table it. Yeah, I'll make a motion. So case 22068, my motion would be that um, we request OPS uh, to request the IT department to provide a, a way for board members to view the MVF lobby files. Um, if there's not something that can be done uh, other than uh, taking a WCS video of those files, then notify us and we'll make best efforts to view that and see if we uh, can use that as evidence. And that so that we table this at least until next meeting to see if that information can be provided. If if it can, it can. And we'll 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 review the case accordingly. If it can't, then I think we just be informed of that, and make a decision at that time. Do we think we can move forward with this case to make a, okay. a determination? Uh friend friendly amended specifically what we we're talking about is uh the videos we were sent to were dot NAF files, which none of us can open on our computers. So that's that's what that's the file type that we have an issue with. I think you said MV yeah, first. So just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Okay. Uh, they're, they're MVF files, right? Am I right on that? The files that we were sent, and I can double check this, but I have in my notes that it was a dot NAF file, November Alpha Foxtrot. Uh, yes, you're correct. I, I second Mr. Ganton's motion. Okay, thank you. Thank you for keeping us on task. Um, <laughs> all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Uh, Mr. Brown is opposed. Anybody uh, abstaining? Okay. Uh, all right, well, the motion carries, so we're going to table that for next month, uh, hopefully with a higher quality version of the footage. If possible, um, but if not, we'll do what we can with what we have. And I think uh, I think then we're ready to move on to the next case, John. When you are uh, docket number eight, case twenty two dash zero nine one, investigator Delaney. The complainant's name is uh, William Daniel. Date of incident was September twenty third of twenty twenty one. It was received by OPS on April twenty second of twenty twenty two. Subject officer's name is Detective Curtis Orr. Badge number 2320, and he's with the Financial Crimes Unit. On April 22nd, OPS received a complaint from William Daniel. He alleged a lack of service against Detective Orr in that uh, Detective Orr failed to interview him regarding a March 2019 report in which he had been identified as a suspect for a theft of a vehicle and was eventually indicted. Detective Orr failed to investigate documents that showed that the March 2019 report filed by uh, Monique Moore was a lie, and Detective Moore failed to fully investigate this March 2019 report due to his friendship with Monique Moore. OPS re uh, investigated allegation A, a lack of service, and the recommendation is that that allegation be sustained. OPS's investigation revealed the following. After identifying William da Daniel as a felony suspect, Policy dictates that Detective Orr should have obtained a statement from Mr. Daniel when he was conducting his investigation into, into the 2019 police report filed by an acquaintance of Mr. Daniel. At the very least, policy dictates that Detective Orr should have attempted to interview Mr. Daniel. The evidence obtained in this investigation revealed that this was not done, resulting in Mr. Daniel not being afforded the opportunity to provide information or evidence to dispute the allegations made against him. It's unknown whether any information provided by Mr. Daniel would have avoided his indictment, but it might have, considering the charges against him were ultimately dismissed 
at the recommendation of the prosecutor. The evidence establishes that Mr. Daniel and Detective Orr had some type of contact with each other in late August of 2021 and that Mr. Daniel submitted documentation to him. Mr. Daniel stated that the contact was in person at Detective Orr's office, while Detective Orr stated that he doesn't recall the in-person meeting. It appears that Detective Orr conducted an initial inquiry into the information that Mr. Daniel had provided him. However, there is no evidence of the, of the results of his, in of his inquiry or whether the information provided to him by Mr. Daniel should have compelled him to conduct a further investigation. Additionally, evidence.com does not show any WCS recordings of any contact between Mr. Daniel and Detective Orr. Without any further evidence, it's unknown whether Detective Orr failed to fully investigate what Mr. Daniel had reported him during this time frame. Finally, there's no evidence presented or discovered during OPS's investigation that establishes that Monique Moore and Detective Orr had a personal relationship or any evidence that establishes that Detective Orr's uh, failed to conduct a full investigation into Ms. Moore's 2019 report due to their alleged relationship. Because the preponderance of the evidence shows that Detective Orr failed to interview and or obtain a statement from Mr. Daniel during the 2019 felony investigation in which Mr. Daniel was identified as the named suspect and violations of his responsibilities as outlined in the division's detective manual, OPS recommends that this allegation be sustained. Okay, thanks, Ms. Delaney. Does anybody have any questions? All right, hearing none, does anybody have any motions they would like to make? Okay, uh, I can make a motion then. So this is uh, case 22 091, the allegation of lack of services against Detective Orr, badge 2320. Uh, my motion is going to be to sustain. Ponderance of evidence, including testimony from the complainant and subject detective and records of the investigation indicates that the alleged conduct, uh, which was a failure to complete a thorough investigation of vehicle theft allegation and specifically that the detective failed to actually interview the, uh, the complainant who was a suspect in the case uh, or make an attempt to do that did occur, uh, which is in violation of the CDP detective manual for just like the bare minimum requirements for a satisfactory investigation. So that motion is to sustain. We have a second. Second. Is that Mr. Sharp? Yes. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. The chair, aye. Uh, yes, yes, sorry, sorry. Is it is it too late to ask a question? Um, in regards to guess, understanding this case? I guess if the motion has been seconded, it, it kind of is, but um, I, I think the motion is it, carried. Yeah, we did kind of all raise our hands already. I didn't really look, but <laughs> um, I guess you could go ahead with your question, Miss Hardy. You said if I had a question to go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, my question is, and you know, I keep harping on this because I just want to get a thorough understanding. So, this case, the date of the incident was September the 23rd, 2021. Okay, so then after six months, so we, so now we're into, it was received by OPS on April the 22nd, 2022. And the date of the investigation began on April the 25th, 2022. So, and I, you know, I'm back to this again, and I, I just want someone to under, to please explain it to me so I can understand, because I'm looking at the collective bargaining agreement. And it says, so this is a citizen complaint that is filed, and then we receive it. Then it's after six months of the date of the alleged event. And the complaint could not lead to a criminal charges. It says then it's, you know, after six months, there's nothing that can be done. I mean, because unless it leads to a criminal charge. So it's on page 10 and I'll read again because I'm looking at your face, but it says when a citizen's complaint is filed more than six months. So that's by OPS after the date of the alleged event. 
and the complaint could not lead to a criminal charge, then it's the bargaining member may be ordered to respond to the complaint. So what does what exactly does that mean? So what um, you had the dates there, could you say the dates again? So the the conduct occurred, you said September 23rd, 2021, right? Right, that's the date of the incident. Uh -huh. And then the date received by OPS was April the 22nd, 2022. And uh -huh. then the date assigned to the investigator was April the 25th, 2022. Okay. And then the date completed by the investigator was August the 10th, 2022. And then date approved by the investigator was August the 10th, 2022. And then, you know, we're in August. So that that six month window that they refer to. That is between it's it's the time that the that the alleged misconduct occurred. So in this case, that's September 23rd, 2021. Um, and the date that the complaint is received by OPS, right? Because it says the complaint has to be filed within six months. Right. So we right. see April so, 20th. So that means, so that means, uh, and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong here, but that's the the complainant filing the complaint with OPS. Is that correct? That's that's my understanding of it. So whatever happens once it gets to OPS, there isn't like a ticking clock on OPS to complete investigations or for us to complete um, our review of the cases. My understanding is that that clock only applies to the complainants having six months to file the complaint. So, um, and even then that doesn't necessarily stop us from receiving it and making a recommendation. Uh, I think that is probably, that's probably like just over, let's see. Is yes. it's probably like seven months. Yeah, it looks like this was seven months later. Yeah, but based on Ms. Hardy's earlier reading of that section, it says that we can make a ruling, but that the officer may not actually be subject to any uh, discipline, right. discipline right. action. But we, we can which is true. Ruling. I would I would also argue that in the case of uh, of an investigation like that, you know, it's not like a single contact where an officer came to your home. And you had one interaction with them, and that definitely happened on one day, right? An investigation is kind of an ongoing thing. So I think there's a strong argument that that might have been the investigation might have been ongoing within six months prior to the complaint being made. So I think that's uh, I think that's above our pay grade. That that argument, if somebody wants to make that argument. Um, I think it's good that we make the res recommendation just so that it sort of preserves that possibility going forward. Um, so does that answer your question, Ms. Hardy? Um, yes, yes, it does. It's above our pay grade. Thank you. No, <laughs> specifically to the timeline thing, though, <laughs> the, the six months is that the complainant has six months to. To make the complaint. Right, but then. Okay, no, the complainant has six months. Okay, yes. wait, wait, wait. When a citizen complaint is filed more than six months after the date of the alleged event. Okay, mm -hmm. so then OPS, how much time do we have? I don't think there's a time limit. Um, okay, so there's no there's no time limit. But shall not okay, so since there's no time limit. It says the charges are not brought within one year. The accused member may be ordered to respond, but shall not be subject to discipline action. So we're sustaining this. But is there going to be any discipline action and that we don't know? Well, I don't think that would be that would even be something to consider. Um, whether, whether or not the disciplinary action would, would happen just because you know, it could be within the time frame, and, and it could get rejected. But I, but I did want to bring up uh, th this line of questioning would have no effect on our prior decision because we went all the way through the process of, of presenting the motion and the motion being carried. Just so we're on track. 
Right, right. I, I, I understand that. I understand. We sustained it. But yeah. if it's after, you know, the fact, you know, he she shall not be subject to disciplinary action. Okay. Thank yeah, you. and I, just and I mean, to... I, I think that even if we, even if that time window is missed for whatever reason, um, I, I think it makes sense for, if we have all the information in front of us, I think it makes sense for us to come to a conclusion um, just so that there's an answer. You know, there's no discipline that comes out of it, but um, in, in I, any, I, think, I think people like to have resolution, right? In any yeah. cases where we sustain an allegation, there's a, there's a hearing and the officer can present whatever evidence or uh, information they want regarding, I guess, what would be their defense. Um, so if they believe that <clears throat> some collective bargaining uh, timelines weren't met, then they could provide that. That that I don't think that blocks us from, and shouldn't block us from weighing in on what we think uh, is appropriate. Right, I I agree. Thank you. Okay, um, so we're we're picking a group on this. We are. So we we're gonna um, John. I'm not sure that I. Did you see the the vote? Did you was that a unanimous vote to sustain? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, the group level um, thinking probably a group level one uh, unsatisfactory performance is in there. Um, I I was I was leaning towards a, a group two. It's just in the group two, the last part where it puts um, uh, officers or public at risk. It just doesn't meet that. But but the first part um, it does. So I guess a group one. Okay, I'm going to make a motion for a group one under uh, unsatisfactory performance. Oh, okay. Okay. second for. I think a bunch of people went at the same time. I'm going to go with Mr. Sharp. Uh, all those in favor, seconded by Mr. Sharp. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The motion carries. So that will be a group one recommendation. Okay, John, uh, ready to move on. Docket number 922-148, Investigator Delaney. <clears throat> Investigator Delaney. Hold on. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, okay, the complainant in this case is Jennifer Williams. Uh, the date of incident is summer of 2020. It was received by OPS in, on July 5th of 2022. Uh, the subject officer's name is Detective John Graves, badge number 2225, and he's with the narcotics unit. On July 5th of 2022, OPS received a complaint from Jennifer Williams. She stated that on June 20th of 2020, her brother was found deceased in his vehicle at 14706 Milverton. She stated that Detective Graves conducted an investigation into her concerns regarding the circumstances of her brother's death, and she, but she believes that he failed to conduct a thorough investigation. OPS <clears throat> investigated allegation A, a lack of service with the recommendation that it be exonerated. OPS's investigation revealed that the evidence showed that Detective Graves responded to the scene where her brother had passed away and interviewed many witnesses that were present and, at her, and or had contact with her brother on the day that he died. He put together a fact pattern of the circumstances that led to his eventual death on June 20th of 2020 and shared the results of, of his investigation with Ms. Williams. The evidence in this investigation shows that no information was presented to Detective Graves or discovered by him that led him to reasonably conclude that, that um, Ms. Williams' brother's death was directly related to any crime. Because the preponderance of the evidence shows that Detective Graves conducted an investigation into the death of Ms. Williams' brother in accordance with his duties as a, as a CDP detective, OPS recommends that allegation A be exonerated. The 
Mr. Gatton. Yeah. Um, are there any questions for the investigator? I'd like to make a motion. I'll take a shot at it. Okay, Mr. Sharp. Okay. Um, case 22-148. Uh, I make the motion that we um, exonerate uh, Detective uh, Groves that um, he operated um, within his duties and um, we uh, take in consideration the OPS report and uh, make it, say it again. Badge number. Oh, I'm sorry, badge number uh, 2225 that um, we exonerate. Second. Okay, yeah, uh, I missed a little bit of that, but I can so, call the vote here. Or, yeah, we, go ahead. Um, okay. Um, so we have a, a motion to exonerate by Mr. Sharp, seconded by Ms. Hardy. Go ahead and hold the vote. All in favor, as you can say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. One abstain. Abstain. I missed most of the uh, discussion on the case. So that motion to exonerate uh, carries. I believe that's it in that case. Correct. Okay. Next is docket ten, case twenty one dash two nine nine. Investigator Hammonds. Uh, good morning. Um, again, this is. Uh, 21-199 of complaint is Terrell Banks. <clears throat> the uh, subject officer is uh, Detective Orville Taylor, 2361. On 11-27-21, uh, uh, the complainant uh, filed a complaint with the Office of Professional Standards alleging that on 11-27-21, uh, he contacted uh, District 5 Detective Bureau regarding his pending criminal case and spoke with Detective Orville Taylor referred to him as a quote pimp end quote he further alleged that he is being discriminated against in the investigation of his criminal case because of the uh gross sexual imposition as part of the charges um the uh citizen stated that he subsequently contacted detective uh detective district five detective bureau via telephone to discuss the nature of his arrest and the charges uh and alleged that the the detective was unprofessional the citizen filed a complaint uh, that uh, he was referred to in, in a disrespectful and unbecoming uh, manner of a law enforcement officer. Uh, a review of the written complaint and subsequent interview with the complainant revealed uh, the complainant was adamant that the conversation occurred on 11-21 or 11-27-2021. Detective Taylor spoke with him disrespectfully on those particular days. However, uh, in the course of the investigation, a review of the District 5 Detective Bureau uh, daily duty assignments, or the DDA, revealed that on 11-22-21 and 11-27-21, <clears throat> Detective Taylor was either on vacation or on furlough for those respective days. Uh, also, a check with the uh, CDP Inspections Unit revealed no duty report activity for Detective Taylor for either of those respective days. Uh, in his 6-1-22 interview with uh, OPS, uh, Detective, Taylor, Detective Taylor stated that he was off work on those alleged days, uh, which is evidenced by the DDA and the uh, um, inspection unit's uh, uh, confirmation that he was on um, furlough on those particular days. Uh, the complainant, again, was adamant that the conversation occurred after 5 p.m., uh, and uh, according to Detective Taylor's normal course of duties, he ends work at 2 p.m. Um, there is no credible, discernible evidence submitted by the complainant that places Detective Taylor on duty on the days in question, nor are there any witnesses, WCS video, or recorded phone statements uh, that occurred. The information tends to render the allegation of unprofessional behavior 
as unfounded and the Office of Professional Standards recommends that the allegation of unprofessional behavior against Detective Taylor be determined as unfounded. Mr. Sharp. Yes, uh, Investigator Hammond. How, yes, how did the um, how did the complainant come to the conclusion or or know to implicate uh, Detective Taylor? If they if if according to what you're saying they didn't have interaction and he wasn't at work on these, how does he know to to implicate this uh, this detective? He told in if in the course of the interview, uh, the phone interview. Uh, he called and stated that he wanted to speak with the detective regarding his case mm. and that he said that he was uh, dispatched to Detective Taylor in the Detective Bureau and that Detective Taylor acted unprofessionally by allegedly calling him a pimp. Um, there's no evidence to confirm the phone call. Uh, in fact, Detective Taylor was not assigned to this case. The investigator, I'm sorry, the detective that was assigned to this case was the detective Coleman. And in the course of the investigation, if you look in the information, uh, detective uh, him being adamant that this happened on the 22nd or the 27th, uh, we reviewed the uh, district duty assignment for 1122. And um, we in, it indicates that detective Coleman did work in a review of detective Coleman's 1122. Um, Duty report does not reflect that he had any conversation with the complainant or that he had conversation regarding the LERMS number of the report associated with this investigation. Uh, and on 1127, uh, according to the uh, DDA for the uh, District 5 uh, Detective Bureau, on 1127, Detective Coleman was not working. Okay. Did, did OPS make any attempts to search the surrounding dates? Now, obviously, I'm not saying we need to go on a, a fishing expedition. You know, obviously, we don't have the dates. We don't have the dates. But was mm -hmm. there any attempt beyond just speaking with the complainant to figure out maybe he has the dates wrong, even if he's adamant? Um, and what was the extent of, of, of that uh, attempt to, to maybe figure out a different date? Well, Member Brown, when the complainant uh, one first, when he was adamant that, that that it was either that weekend or the weekend the week uh, the day of the twenty second or the day of the twenty seventh, um, and the fact that it was after five p.m., um, his uh, the the impact of, of of where he wanted us to look became affected. However, it didn't prevent us from doing so because we did take the uh, the DDA from the uh, particular days. Now, going beyond those days, um, it could have turned into uh, a major task because we didn't know what day to, to, to narrow this down to other than the days that he provided. And, and, that and, just, your question. and just a follow up. So the, the actual uh, detective that got it, they got this case, there's no indication that he actually talked to this complainant either. Not Correct. on the dates that the complainant states. So er earlier you mentioned something about the, the LERMS number that would have been attached to the complainant's underlying case. Correct. Is there a way to run a search by LERMS number to see all of the interactions that were done to see if maybe there was an interaction that was had regarding that case and maybe match that up not from lerms it would have come from the follow-up detective report and consistent with how we have been communicating here in the board uh in previous cases i believe it may have even been the first or the second case this was an ongoing case mr uh banks had been subsequently indicted in this particular case uh and we moved forward so the uh review of the detective manual, I'm sorry, the detective report, the follow-up report was not completed because um, this was an ongoing case uh, for which Mr. Uh, Banks was indicted. So at the point in time that this complaint was completed, A, the case was ongoing, and B, there was nothing discernible that he pre presented to us that would have led us to believe that uh, either of the detectives were involved in this in the phone call only. 
Mr. Hammonds, do we have, uh, are there recordings of uh, detectives phone calls with citizens? No, which is uh, what I've been told is that the detectives uh, should, uh, and uh, most of them do, merely to uh, protect themselves is to record uh, conversations with uh, com uh, with sub suspects on their WCS. Here, there was no such uh, uh, WCS uh, available that uh, in this window that captured any communication uh, between them uh, that was recorded. And, and also the uh, CCS does not record uh, conversations that uh, come into or leave from uh, a district phone. Yeah. Yes, sir. No, never mind. Okay, anybody else have any further questions? Does anybody have a motion they'd like to make? Go ahead, Dave. Uh, case 21 299, uh, allegation of unprofessional conduct against Detective Taylor, badge number 2361. Um, I'm going to motion that this be unfounded. Preponderance of that supports a finding that the alleged conduct did not occur, uh, at least certainly not based on what the complaint was. Perhaps there's something outside of the complaint that did occur, but we don't have anything that uh, provides us any evidence to that. Um, we do have evidence of Detective Taylor not being at work uh, the days that the, the complaint was made for. So it is unfounded what is in the complaint. So that would be my motion. For that same reason, I will second that motion. Okay, uh, motion is for unfounded. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Okay, uh, we will not be presenting docket 11. It was brought to my attention that the WCS was not provided to the board. That will be presented at, a, at another board hearing. So we'll move on to docket 12. Case 22-103, Investigator Harris. Good morning. This is OPS complaint 22-103. The complainant is Robert Jones. The date of the incident was May 3rd, 2022. Subject officers are Patrol Officer Rafael Carasini, badge 371, and Officer Todd Clemens, badge 1096. Date received by OPS was May 16th, 2022. And they officers are assigned to District 2 patrol. Allegations are lack of service as well as unprofessional behavior. Brief synopsis on May 16, 2022, OPS received a complaint from Robert Jones. In his complaint, Mr. Jones stated that on May 3rd, 2022, at about 2300 hours, he was rear-ended by a drunk driver. The suspect then attempted to flee the scene, so he got in front of the suspect's vehicle to, uh, keep, to prevent him from leaving. Mr. Jones then noticed two Cleveland police officers nearby who observed the incident. Mr. Jones flagged down the officers. One of the officers obtained his information, but allowed the suspect to flee the scene without obtaining his information. Mr. Jones feels the officers let the suspect get away and did not want to assist him in this accident. Regarding allegation A, lack of service, OPS recommends that CDP officer Todd Clemens, badge 1096, and Rafael Carasini, badge 371, be exonerated of allegation A, lack of service, because this investigation revealed the officers were compliant with manual rule 4.18 and GPO 8.01.02. The rationale, Mr. Jones expressed concerns that the officers observed the accident and didn't offer immediate assistance. After he told the officers about the accident, only one officer got out of the vehicle. He feels the officers did not want to provide any assistance. A review of the officers WCS show both officers did exit their zone car. Officer Clemens told the unidentified party to, re to retrieve his driver's license and insurance card 
while he obtained Mr. Jones information. Officer Clemens stated he did not observe any signs of intoxication, such as staggering or slurring during his interaction with the other party. Officer Carasini cleared traffic and obtained Mr. Jones license plate number. The other party fled the scene before the officers could identify him. Once Officer Clemens realized the other party left the scene, he tried to locate him but was unsuccessful. The other party was later identified and a traffic crash report was completed, naming him as the person at fault in compliance with the GPO 8.1.02. Regarding allegation B, unprofessional behavior, OPS recommends a finding, a finding of unfounded for allegation B against Officer Todd Clemens, badge 1096, because the preponderance of the evidence supports the finding that Officer Clemens was not hostile when interacting with the complainant. The rationale, Mr. Jones expressed concerns that Officer Clemens was unprofessional. He said that Officer Clemens was very hostile when he spoke to him about the accident. Also, he believes Officer Clemens' attitude and demeanor was very unprofessional. However, a review of Officer Clemens WCS showed he was actually professional and patient throughout his encounter with Mr. Jones. Officer Clemens did not raise his voice or speak to Mr. Jones in an aggressive or demeaning manner in compliance with manual rule 5.09. Okay, thanks, Mr. Harris. Does anybody have any questions about the investigation? Mr. Sharp? Question, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, are agendas in, entered into the record as far as note taking? Um, I think that the, the minutes, like the minutes for this meeting will probably be based largely on the agenda, um, but I, I think that and you know the agendas are recorded themselves, but I, is why is that? Is there an error in the agenda? Yeah, but but I don't want to keep pointing out that the agenda is incorrect if it doesn't affect the uh, the um, the 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 record. But in, yeah, I in mean, this I, case, the, the record is going to reflect the all of the motions that we vote on, whether or okay. not they were on the agenda. Because because this on the agenda it has. Um, 2-103 and it's really 22-103. Yeah, it's. I know it's a typo, right. but I'm saying I don't want to keep bringing stuff up like that up if it doesn't affect the record. It needs to be brought up. No, it's not the. Uh, it's not a jurisdictional defect or anything like that. Um, but it's yeah. I mean, they're all uh, public records, mm -hmm. and so mo I mean, the agenda and the minutes are public records. Um, but yeah, there's not. Um, a typo won't render uh, the board's. Uh, any action taken by the board as uh, void. Okay. All right. Well, I'm just noting that, that that that's a typo. But we go ahead. I'm sorry. So it should be correct, right? What case number is it? That's what ten, twelve, 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 and it's number twelve, Miss Hardy. Okay. So it's two dash one hundred three, and is that's not what it is? It should be two dash one hundred three. One hundred three. Okay, so we'll note that for the record. I would ask uh, OPS to correct that. Thank you. And uh, okay, so as far as the case presentation goes, anybody have any questions about that? I'll, I'll make some comments on this. Um, sure. And I guess this is uh, maybe my preamble to what motions that I would make if nobody else would want to. Um, the video doesn't really show anything in terms of unprofessional behavior. Uh, the WCS uh, of two officers doesn't show that, in my opinion. So I agree with the investigator there. In terms of lack of service, yeah, they investigated it. They they got the license numbers. Um, uh, but we have two officers here. Um, the uh, driver of the the car that rear ends the complainant. Uh, walks over to the officer. Um, I don't know that there's anything in that video that shows he was drunk or slurring or whatever. Uh, it's a very brief interaction and officer says, well, go, go back to your car, get your license, get your insurance. And I think within a minute, we could see in the background, uh, this guy was somebody else uh, walking down the sidewalk, in fact, stops to talk to uh, 
three people that are on the sidewalk within maybe a hundred feet of the officer and then kind of just strolls away down the street. Um, so it, it's, you know, when, when, the, when the language says, you know, that he fled the scene. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's what it was, but it, it was more like he strolled away from the, the scene and these officers don't seem to have been paying attention to, you know, we, we've got two people involved in this accident and one guy just, he walked down the street. So, I see that as an inattention to their their duty, and um, you know that's that's how I viewed that. Um, yeah, they provided some service, but there was inattention to to providing a, a complete service, and and ultimately the complainant um, doesn't didn't have the insurance information from the guy who strolled away, um, and and in my opinion, you know I I. I wouldn't agree with the investigator that service was provided, at least not wholly in this case. I don't know how others see that. I think the big thing in that instance, less than um, less than like insurance information or personally identifying information, um, there's an evidence preservation issue in driving cases because of the. Uh, if if that guy happened to have alcohol in his system, if he wouldn't have, you know, passed a sobriety test at that time, and then he goes home and sleeps it off, and then that evidence is kind of lost forever. So, just to add to your point, um, does anybody else have any other thoughts on this? I think just to piggyback off of uh, Mr. Guy, and I completely agree. I would definitely. Um, I would definitely see that. I'm sorry if I hear my cat in the background, but I would definitely see that as um, lack of service. Um, what you see in that video is he he genuinely just, you know, kind of like walks off. And if I'm sitting here um, thinking about my car, I need insurance information. Um, my car could possibly be totaled. Who's going to be responsible for this? And then we all just look back and the other driver is gone. And there's two police officers here. I would expect for one police officer to be dealing with me, the other one to be dealing with the other person in the accident. But yet, that's not what happened. So I would understand a person saying that this is lack of service because you did not go to the fullest extent of your capabilities when dealing with my incident. So I understand. Now, don't get me wrong. His information, uh, the second party, was um, was gotten later due to another incident, but it still does remove the fact of my incident at that time not being not so much taken seriously but um certain protocols were not in place so i would have to agree mr guyton can i add one thing <clears throat> and i know sure. the officers um because i know the ems and the fire engine came i know the other officer was dealing with uh you know traffic control as well as also you know you know advising ems and fire exactly what was going on and if anybody did need um any type of uh medical treatment at that time Okay, uh, anybody else have any thoughts or questions? Dave, it sounded like you had some motions you might want to make. Yeah, I, I will. Case 2203, okay. uh, a lack of service against uh, Officer Arucini, C A R U C I N I, badge number 371. Um, the WCS clearly shows that. Um, one of the drivers in the uh, accident uh, walked up to the officer, walked away, and then strolled away in the background uh, near the officer. Um, so th he was at minimum inattentive uh, and ultimately was unable to provide the service needed by <clears throat> the uh, driver of the car who had got rear-ended. So uh, my motion for this will be that uh, the allegation of lack of service be sustained. Uh, the officer did not fulfill his duties in terms of investigation of this, which should at a minimum be to make sure the people involved don't, don't walk away. This wasn't a case where the guy took off sprinting down the road or hopped in another car or anything. I mean, he, he walked, he stopped. Uh, in plain view and just continued to walk away. And we had two officers there and they both missed it. Um, so they 
they were not um, diligent in performance of their duty under 4.18 of investigating uh, all reports of criminal activity that comes to their attention. Second. Okay, second from Ms. Hardy. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that motion carries. Did you have a group level in mind, Dave? Yeah. Um, I would I would put this under um, a group one unsatisfactory performance. Um, I don't know that there's a specific to you know inattention to detail uh, or something like that, but you know I, it's certainly on a, it's certainly unsatisfactory to let a potential suspect stroll away from the scene. Okay. Second. All right. Second for Ms. Hardy. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Motion carries. Same case. Keep going, Dave? Yeah, same case. Uh, Officer Clemens, badge number 1096. For the same reasons, he was on site. He was there. He was on the street. In fact, he was uh, had to be standing where the, uh, the suspect, the guy that was driving the car that rear-ended the other one, uh, walked past him on the sidewalk and, again, completely missed it. So for the same rationale uh, used uh, previously, um, I motion that we sustain the lack of service allegation. Second. Okay. Motion is to sustain. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Group level? Yeah, and again, I'll say a, a group level one uh, is their, their inattention or his inattention to detail, uh, making sure that a suspect didn't just walk away from the scene is at minimum unsatisfactory performance. Second. Second from Ms. Hardy. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. We have additional uh, allegations against both officers here for unprofessional behavior um, regarding Kerasini badge 371. Uh, my motion there will be that it's unfounded. WCS footage shows that at no time does uh, the officer act unprofessional toward the complainant, nor his passenger, um, nor anyone uh, on the scene. Um, so it, the conduct did not occur, unprofessional conduct did not occur. Second. Second from Ms. Hardy. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Uh, same case. Uh, Officer Clemens, badge number 1096, allegation of unprofessional behavior. Uh, same thing. Uh, my, my motion will be unfounded. WCS does not show that uh, he was unprofessional toward any uh, people. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Motion carries. Okay, and I think that covers it for that case. Yes. Okay. Uh, so thanks, Mr. Harris. Uh, it is eleven fifty-six now, so uh, I guess we could take we're going to take about a fifteen-minute break. We could either do that now or we try to squeeze in one more case. Anybody have a strong preference that they need to duck out now? Okay, let's uh, charge on. Try to get one more in before lunch. To the extent that that is a lunch break. <clears throat> hmm. right, uh, docket 13, case number 22 153, Investigator Harris again. All right, this is OPS complaint 22 153. The complainant is Joy Swan. Date of incident is June 18, 2022. Subject officers are Officer Joseph Russo, badge 231 and P.O. Olithia Hayden, batch 600. Date received by OPS was July 5th, 2022, and both officers are assigned to District 4 patrol. Allegations are lack of service and unprofessional behavior. 
Brief synopsis. On July 5th, 2022, OPS received a complaint from Joy Swan. In her complaint, Ms. Swan stated officers failed to investigate an allegation of sexual assault involving her juvenile daughter, and the officers were unprofessional, excuse me, unprofessional to her based on the questions they asked. Regarding allegation A, lack of service, OPS recommends a finding of sustained against CDP officer Joseph Russo, badge 231, for allegation A, lack of service, because this investigation revealed the officer did not investigate the complainant's concerns that her daughter was sexually assaulted. The rationale, the complainant expressed concerns that Officer Russo failed to investigate her concerns that Janaya Swan was sexually assaulted. A review of Officer Russo's WCS shows at the five minute and nine second mark, Joy Swan <coughs> tells the officer that there, she heard that her daughter was living with the male and he was touching and molesting her. Also, she stated several people told her they saw the unidentified male and her daughter kissing at the store. At the six minute and 50 second mark, Joy Swan said the, unide the unidentified male is 30 years old and Janiah Swan is only 14 years old. During Officer Russo's OPS interview, he stated Joy and Swan had third party information that her daughter was sexually assaulted or molested by an older male in the apartment in which she was residing. Also, people said they saw Janiah Swan and the older man kissing. He didn't have time to investigate the residence Janiah Swan was living at because she jumped out the second story window when they went to locate her. He didn't have an opportunity to go back to the residence and investigate any further because things escalated on scene. They chased after Janiah Swan and when they located her, she began harming herself, so they didn't have a chance to investigate the sexual assault. He didn't, in the, he didn't get to interview Janiah Swan because she refused to speak with him. Officer Russo did not make any attempt to investigate the sexual assault allegations. After transporting Janiah Swan to the hospital, Officer Russo did not go back to the residence and did not speak with any parties inside the residence or around the residence. Therefore, Officer Russo did not identify the male that Janiah Swan was residing with. Also, Officer Russo did not document the sexual assault allegations in his report 2022-172914. Sergeant Al Albert Oliver, badge 9220, was the supervisor on scene. Officer Russo did not notify Sergeant Oliver of the sexual assault allegations or ask him to speak with the people at the residence in which Janiah was living. At the hospital, Officer Russo did not inform the medical staff of the sexual assault allegations involving Janiah Swan. When asked why he didn't notify the medical staff, of the sexual assault allegations, he stated the following, quote, if she was being sexually assaulted, she would have explained that to the doctor because they have protocols at the doctor. Also, the mother could have relayed that information to her. The Division of Manual Rules and Regulations, Section 4.18, uses the non-discretionary discretionary language, shall immediately proceed the statement, investigate all reports of suspected criminal activity requiring police actions that come to their attention. Even though Janiah Swan fled the scene and had to be transported to the hospital, Officer Russo still had the responsibility to investigate and at least document the sexual assault allegations. Regarding allegation B, unprofessional behavior, OPS recommends that CDP officer Joseph Russo 231 and Olithia Hayden batch 600 be exonerated of allegation B, unprofessional behavior, because this investigation revealed that both officers were respectful and courteous to the complainant as well as her daughter. The rationale, Ms. Swan expressed concerns that Officer Russo and Officer Hayden were unprofessional based on the questions they asked. However, a review of both officers WCS showed they were very professional and patient throughout their encounter with the complainant and her daughter. Neither officer was rude or disrespectful. Even when Janiah Swan fled the scene, the officers never became irate and maintained professionalism. During Officer Russo's OPS interview, he stated he was very professional and that he was very apathetic towards uh, Ms. Swan and her daughter's concerns. OK. <clears throat> OK, thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the investigation? Yeah, Mr. Sharp, go ahead. He's muted. Uh, yeah, if you're talking, you're, you're muted right now. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, the the lack of service charge. Why does it not apply to the second officer? Was were, were these two officers partners, or they arrived separately? No, the uh, female that she mentions, which is Officer Hayden, she was not 
actually present when she was explaining the uh, sexual assault allegations. So she actually only told Officer Russo about the sexual assault allegations. That's why it was only him that's named as the um, okay. subject officer. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, anybody else? Does anybody have any motions they would like to make? Yeah. Um, I'll take a crack at it. Go ahead. Okay. Um, case 22 153, uh, Officer Russo, badge number uh, 231. My motion is uh, that we sustain uh, the allegation of lack of service for the officer's just blatant disregard for um, for his duties. Um, by, every, uh, by everything in the OPS uh, um, uh, investigation, uh, just a blatant disregard for the officer's duties and to something, the magnitude of uh, sexual allegations against a 14-year-old and just absolutely no follow-up and just on a personal note the the comment that she should have told the doctor or the mother could have uh could have reported it that's a total abdication of his responsibilities in that regard so i i would say um i make the motion that we sustain that against officer russo second okay uh all those in favor please raise your hand and say aye 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 Aye. Any opposed? Extensions? Okay, motion carries, and then we need a group level for that. Um, on that, I am going to say a, a group two, and specifically to the last part of group two, that it would put um, um, have implications on public safety. Um, not following up on that, I think it may have subject that the young lady to continued abuse. So I think it certainly meets a group two. Okay, and I would add uh, <clears throat> group two also uh, calls for service failure to respond, investigate, arrest, and or properly clear. Um, so, okay, so do we have a second for that? Second. Okay, all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, that motion carries. Um, did you want to go ahead with the unprofessional conduct? Uh, sure. Allegations as well. Yep. Um, so same case, uh, 22-1153. Am I doing both officers in this or do them separately or what? You got to do it separately, but you can reference the first one. Okay. So, uh, officer Russo badge number 231. Um, I, I, I make the the um, motion that unprofessional conduct or unprofessional is unfounded just by preponderance of the evidence, and it doesn't show that 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 happened. So I make the recommendation of unfounded, or is it exonerated? Which 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 should I be saying? Uh, well, that's up to you. The recommendation from OPS was exonerated. Uh, I actually have unfounded in my notes personally. So okay, I'll 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 stick with unfounded. Okay. So the, the just just for for clarification on that, there, mm-hmm. there are definitions under unfounded means that it did not occur at all. Uh, exonerated means that conduct did occur, but that it was within the you know police orders or uh, you know their that that what they did was consistent with their training. Um, and we've had examples before, like. You know, somebody could complain and say, you know, police officer cuffs on me. We could exonerate them, which would basically say, yeah, that that did occur, but there wasn't an abuse or it was an it was appropriate that the officer did that. If the cuffs were never put on and that was the allegation, then it would be unfounded. That that's how I view the. Okay. That. So I'll I'll take your cue on that. I'll go with um, exonerated. Can I amend that or do I have to say it all over again? Uh, I think we got it. Your motion's for exonerated? Yeah. Okay. All right. Do we have a second for that? Second. Second for Ms. Hardy. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, that motion carries. Okay. All right. Uh, same case. 2-2-153. Two, two uh, uh, Officer Hard Harding. I'm pronouncing it wrong. Badge Hayden. number Hayden. Sorry. Badge number uh, 600. Um, uh, unprofessional. I, I'm going to go with uh, ex exonerated uh, by preponderance of the evidence and, and the fact that the officer was not told, um, and I mean, not told, not, not told, that um, it, it, that it, interactions did occur, but she was not unprofessional. So um, exonerated. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, that motion carries. I think that covers it for that case, right, Mr. Harris? Yeah, I think so. Great, thank you. Okay, right, thank uh, you. As, as promised, uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break here. So I'll see you guys at uh, 1225. Okay.
Yeah. I like it here.
All right, uh, just give Dave a couple more seconds to, uh, I see he's got his camera on, he's just got to return to us, so I think he'll be back here pretty shortly, and we'll get started. There he is, right on cue. All right, John, everybody ready? Yep. Thank you. Uh, we will continue on with docket 14, case 22-020, Investigator Szymanski. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Loud yes. clear. Okay, perfect. Um, this is case 2022-0145. The complainant is Ben Lovejoy. The date of the incident was November 24th, 2021. And it was followed with the Office of Professional Standard Standards on January 24th of 2022. The allegation was unprofessional behavior conduct and the officer involved was police officer Eric Thompson, badge number 155. Synopsis, on January 24th, 2022, the Office of Professional Standards received a complaint from the complainant Ben Lovejoy Mr. Lovejoy alleged on November 24th of 2021, Police Officer Thompson, badge 880, issued a ticket, a warning, and a housing ticket at his residence at 3413 Daisy Avenue in Cleveland, Ohio. Mr. Lovejoy alleged Police Officer Thompson made a false allegation of rats at his house in front of his neighbors 
and ticketed his, ticketed his van parked in his driveway because it had a flat tire. Mr. Lovejoy, his neighbor, well, my, my apologies, Mr. Lovejoy stated when he attempted to explain to police officer Thompson badge number 880 about his tire, he alleged police officer Thompson disagreed and threatened him to housing court because, because he disposed of the ticket. The Office of Professional Standards recommends that Allegation A, Unprofessional Behavior Conduct Against Police Officer Eric Thompson, badge number 880, be determined as exonerated. The Office of Professional Standards recommends that Allegation A, Unprofessional Behavior Conduct Against Police Officer Eric Thompson, be exonerated as the preponderance of evidence supports a finding that the newly alleged conduct of manual rule 5.02 and 5.11 occurred, but the officer's actions were consistent with the law, the manual of rules for the conduct and discipline of employees of the Cleveland Division of Police and the Cleveland Division of General Police Orders. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the investigation? Okay, uh, I think I would just ask for the record. Can you elaborate a little bit on um, on what Officer Thompson's side of their uh, interaction was and what the WCS footage showed? Yeah, so Police Officer Thompson's WCS demonstrated that the complainant's vehicle was parked on the sidewalk and was full of trash, which justified Police Officer Thompson's issuance of writing a citation and warning of Mr. Lovejoy's vehicle per the codified ordinance of Cleveland, Ohio, 451.23. In addition to this, his WCS demonstrated the driveway of the dwellings full of vehicles, garbage, dwellings full of vehicles, garbage and waste in the yard, on the porch, and on the property, thus justifying police officer Thompson issuing a summons to the complainant for ordinance 369.08, rubbish and garbage disposal. Regarding to the alleged conduct of police officer Thompson's Badge number 880, making the false allegation of rant at his house in front of the neighbors. The WCS did not find this conduct that it did not occur and he did not make these statements. Okay, thanks. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions about the investigation? Hearing none, does anybody have any motions they'd like to make on the case? Dave? Case 22020, <clears throat> Officer Thompson, badge number 880, allegation of unprofessional behavior. Um, the interactions are clearly shown on the WCS. Uh, Officer Thompson is professional throughout, explains why he wrote the ticket. Um, the complainant uh, alleged that he told neighbors that he had rats, what he did tell neighbors and was seen on WCS was um, he's got a lot of paraphrasing here. He's got a lot of junk there and it could lead to having rats or roaches. Who knows? He, he's made that statement and he, and he actually said that to the complainant. So this didn't rise to a level of unprofessional behavior. The conduct was consistent with manual rule 5.02 and 5.11. So my recommendation will be that this uh, allegation be unfounded. <clears throat> okay, do we have a second for that? Second. Second from Ms. Hardy. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that motion carries. We on? Uh, I think we're good to move on. Yes. Docket 15, case 22-144, Investigator Szymanski. Okay. This is case 2022-0144, the complainant is Mr. Corey Rainey. The date of the incident was June 18th, 2022, and it was filed with OPS or the Office of Professional Standards on July 5th of 2022. 
The allegation was unprofessional behavior, conduct, and, and improper stop. Officers involved was Detective Connor O'Day, badge number 873. On July 5th of 2022, Mr. Cor Corey Rainey submitted a complaint and reported unprofessional behavior conduct against Detective Connor O'Day, badge number 873, stating that he and other CPD officers aggressively stopped him in unmarked cars. During the traffic stop, Mr. Rainey alleged Detective O'Day aggressively hit his window, accused him of having drugs in his vehicle, and snapped, snatched open his car door. Mr. Rainey alleged officers failed to follow proper procedures when they failed to obtain the owner registration. The Office of Professional Standards recommends that Allegation A, Unprofessional Behavior Conduct Against Detective Connor O'Day, badge number 873, be determined as exonerated. The Office of Professional Standards recommends that Allegation B, improper stop against Detective Connor O'Day, badge number 873, be determined as exonerated. The Office of Professional Standards recommends that Allegation A, unprofessional behavior conduct against Detective Connor O'Day be determined as exonerated. As a preponderance of evidence to include the complainant's statements, officer statements, and officer's WCS that the officer hit knocked on the complainant's window to gain the complainant's compliance, supports a finding that the alleged conduct occurred, but the officer's actions were consistent with law, CPD policy, training, and or procedures. The Office of Professional Standards recommends that allegation B, improper stop, against Detective Connor O'Day be determined as exonerated, as the preponderance of evidence supports that the alleged conduct occurred, but the officer's actions were consistent with the law, Cleveland Division of Police Orders, training, and procedures. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Does anybody have any questions for the investigator? Thoughts on this case? Go ahead, Mr. Sharp. What was the initial reason for the stop? I think I missed that. Window tint. Window tint, okay. Yeah. And they, they did the, uh, the test on it, not just by visual? Correct. Right. Uh, yeah, they did the they did the visual. I mean, they did the test, and uh, Detective O'Day measured the test to be fourteen percent. Thank you. <clears throat> so I guess um, I don't know. I would just solicit some opinions here on the uh, on the unprofessional conduct allegation. I mean, there there was. This is kind of an ongoing uh, strategy that these guys have for drug enforcement, right? They find um, suspicious-looking vehicles and pull them over for something like window tint or something else that is probably pretextual, which is not per se. I mean, they're they're allowed to make a pretextual stop, right? Um, and I just the. The behavior of a detective O'Day here, I thought, um, was was gruff at best. Um, you know, at one point they were pretty convinced they had found a baggie of marijuana in the car, which ended up being a baggie full of pennies. Um, and I think that there was a. I just sense that there was a. There was not a positive tone shift after that occurred. I, I just got the sense that uh, the officers who were involved in that kind of doubled down. Um, and so I, I don't know, I guess I would just ask for everybody's opinions on whether or not we think that that. Uh, that interaction was appropriate uh, as a reflection of what we want CDP officers to be operating like. Just. One more question. What kind of unit was this again? The uh, narcotics unit. Okay, go ahead. Well, it, you know, we have seen the window tint as a rationale to pull cars over, and it's the word that it's a pretext, but it is in fact a violation. In fact, it did test that it was that the windows were uh, illegally they they were too tinted. I'm, I'm 
struggling to find the word there. So I, I, well, I, I don't disagree with, you know, kind of where, where you're at on that, that these guys you know, may be looking for reasons to pull cars over. We, you know, there, there's nothing that says that if they do see a violation on a car that they cannot pull them over. So that, that activity is consistent with the law and consistent with Cleveland Police Department policies. You know, if we see it, if they see a tail light not working, they can pull a car over for that as well. So there are a number of things that give them the right to do that. So they're, they're not stepping afoul of policy or procedure when they do that. I just want to kind of state that. Yeah, that, that is a good point. That's not, that's not the issue here. I'm, I'm right. just, yeah. Uh, I just, I just wanted to clarify that, that, that while we could have our opinions, whether or not they should be pulling cars over for illegal tint or not. Um, and if that's a good use of their time or not, or why they're doing it or not, um, it is legal for them to do that. Yeah. So legitimate rationale to pull a car over. Just to interject the, the leap from tent to drugs, I think, um, exist. Now I've, I've gotten pulled over for tent before. Um, luckily it was not, um, of the illegal, uh, range, but when I got pulled over the implication that I had drugs in the car soon followed. And I, I, when you pull, when you pull me over and roll the window down, I have on a, a suit jacket and tie. So how you, you then still assume that, that, uh, drugs are in the car. But I think, um, the, uh, I'll say for lack of a better word, profiling, because someone has tent that, um, illegal activity, um, is, is in the midst somewhere. So, um, I'm, I'm kind of with Mr. Hess and, and I know how, um, they they were not nice in saying, "Hey, are there drugs in the car?" So that's just personal experience. So I probably will pull back from this a bit more, just because I may be slanted one way or the other. But um, I just want everybody that exists. No, and and, and and just for a record, I want to state that um, you know we're we're a, we're a group of civilians uh, being asked to to weigh in on these cases and we all, you know, every every single person here has, has unique experiences and and those become important in how we, you know, the lens that we use to view this. My my point was that I believe that it is it's fair of citizens to say, you know, wonder why they pulled that car over because of tent, or it's fair to say Wonder why they pulled the car, you know, that that car over because of the, the you know, the race of the person driving it. Um, we could ask those questions, um, but at least from a policy and procedure and legal aspect, uh, you know, like it or not, uh, an officer suspecting that a car has too much tint gives them the right to pull that car over. Um, we don't need to like that. I'm just I'm just making that statement, and I'm I'm not dismissing that. Um, it, it does kind of give rise to why do you think they pulled that car over? You know, not dismissing that for a second. I'm just saying that our lens at some point needs to be: Are they following policy and procedure? And we might not like that policy and procedure. You know, for example, they cannot pull a car over for a seatbelt. Um, that can be a secondary charge. Um, so, you know, had they pulled him over saying, Hey, we saw you weren't wearing a seatbelt that, that, that makes it different, but tint can be a primary reason. That's all. I think so, if, I think if they didn't, uh, charge him with the tint, then you have more basis to go along with what you said, Mike. Yeah, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I think we're all in agreement on the improper stop here. I'm just the, the totality of the stop, um, I, I guess, and leaning more towards the unprofessional conduct allegation. Um, I, I'm, I'm just, I don't know. A, a lot of this really rubbed me the wrong way. Um, and I think there were some comments that uh, the detective made 
while he was out of earshot of the uh, complainant, and he was kind of in his car or somebody else's car. Um, and while I am generally not of the mind that we should be policing every word that comes out of everybody's mouths, because this is, you know, it's it's hard to it's hard to be on 100% of the time, but there were some things that he said that really indicated to me uh, what his mindset was going into this stop um, that honestly kind of troubled me a little bit. So, um, um, okay, Miss Miller, you had your hand up. What's up? Yes, um, I would say being on the board, we have run into this situation like time and time again where a police officer was not directly in front of the person that he was supposed to be helping. However, WCS footage catches him saying some very vulgar things, and we come to the conclusion since <clears throat> WCS footage is a type of documentation that is made sometimes to the public, especially as it pertains to us reviewing cases and things of that nature, then it is still you know, um, an incident where we still hold them accountable. And right, we shouldn't be policing every single word that is said. Um, however, I think the the words that were used that were extremely disturbing, that were still caught, we still need to hold him accountable on. So I completely agree with you, Mr. Hess. Um, it's just often we see these types of cases where it might have been not right in front of the complainant. However, it's still caught on WCS. It's still caught on other video footage, which is still made to the public. It's still legitimate evidence. It is. I agree. Yeah, and and I also I know I know we have had this discussion, and I I generally haven't been on that side of the argument, uh, and I don't think it's a, what he said was necessarily offensive, um, greatly offensive, but. Uh, I, th I think as it relates to just his his mindset about the traffic stop and law enforcement in general, I guess is where my head is at with it. And Mr. Hess, yeah, I agree with you because we're we're looking at you. You know, stop. Okay, he the law was broke. The windows. Okay, so he's stopping for that. So, but then when we talk about unprofessional behavior conduct and being gruff so these are you know and there are some codes that go to this too we could go to 5.01 you know um different codes uh, but i i agree with you on that because when you have that mindset um you know it just your behavior just follows okay um Anybody else have any thoughts and then we'll call for motions? Yeah, just, just a quick thought about the continuation of the stop. Um, one thing that I found about some of these, uh, I'll, I'll just say technically correct stops. Um, I think, uh, Dave, you made some, some great points about, yeah, at the end of the day, like if, if the tents are illegal, they're illegal. Um, and, and that's and stopping someone for tents is definitely legal. But we should always be cognizant that, you know, that doesn't give you carte blanche to do what you, whatever you want to do once you pull the car over, right? You need independent, reasonable suspicion to conduct a further search of some sort. You know, you need articulable suspicion of drugs and tense. I don't know, we argue we're blowing the face, but I would say having tense is not articulable suspicion of drug activity, right? So um, while I'm not disagreeing with anyone, I do agree that the stop was, um, seem to be lawful. Uh, I just think that we should keep that in mind, both now and going forward, that a stop that is initially lawful can become unlawful uh, at some point. Um, and also, yeah, I agree, the demeanor of the officer um, was, was certainly un unprofessional. And let, let me just just add this in there. Um, so the, this is more the, the personal experience. So I, I agree that um, pull anybody over that's a violation, speeding, um, tenant windows, what what have you. Absolutely. So, um, but you should be pulling them over for that reason only at that time. So an, an officer got behind me, tenant windows, they believed. But the, the thing was, followed me so far down the road, was ran my uh, place, my license uh, came up, can clearly see now who I am. And then at that point, the lights came on. So 
um, one, one could reasonably assume that there was some profiling in, involved in that. So, um, and then again, the, the attitude once they got to the car w was certainly accusatory. And that, that's why in, in this case, um, w when you say uh, unprofessional, I can, his mode of thinking, the comments that he made goes right into that. So that, that's sort of where I'm at, but thank you. Okay. Does anybody have any motions they'd like to make? Okay, uh, hearing none, I can make some motions. I'm going to start with the improper stop allegation as against Detective O'Day, H 873. Uh, motion for that is going to be exonerated. Uh, preponderance of evidence, including WCS footage of the traffic stop and testimony from the complainant and subject officer, indicates the alleged conduct, uh, which was initiating a traffic stop of the complainant. Uh, did occur. It was consistent with manual rule 4.18. Uh, and uh, in in furtherance of uh, enforcement of Cleveland codified ordinance 437.28, uh, which is a rule that dictates uh, window tint and window darkness. So that motion again for the improper stop is to exonerate. For clarification in the report, that is allegation B. Allegation B. Yeah, I did. I did start with that one first. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll second. Second from Mr. Sharp. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. That motion carries. So for the unprofessional conduct allegation. Um, my motion is going to be to sustain that. Uh, this is again for Detective O'Day, Badge 873. Uh, preponderance of evidence, which includes a WCS footage of the traffic stop and testimony from the complainant subject officer, um, indicates the alleged conduct did occur. Um, that conduct includes, uh, you know, initiating the traffic stop, I think that the officer was initially like extremely hostile. Um, during the course of the traffic stop, they identified something that they thought might have been contraband, uh, which wasn't. And and I think that that kind of made him very determined to try to find something. Um, You know, I, I know that the, the stop was initially for uh, window tint, but I, I think that it just made him increasingly hostile towards the complainant. Uh, and that sort of echoed in a lot of the comments that he made that were uh, that were recorded on his WCS. Uh, they were out of earshot of the complainant, but I think that it, it gives light to what his mindset was. And I think that it's unprofessional to take a situation where a complainant is trying to exercise his rights um, and and use that to sort of build hostility uh, and act aggressively towards him during the course of traffic stop. Uh, so that's inconsistent with manual rules 5.01, 5.08, 5.09. And uh, that motion again is to sustain. So do we have a second for that? Second for Ms. Hardy. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Okay, uh, Mr. Mountcastle opposes. Any abstentions? Okay, so that motion is going to carry. And then... Uh, the group. As to the group level, uh, I think I'm going to motion for a group one violation under discourtesy and rudeness. Second. Okay. Uh, second from Ms. Hardy. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Okay. One in opposition. Mr. Mountcastle, any abstentions? Okay. That motion carries. Okay. And I think that covers it. Thank uh, you for that case. So, John, ready to move on. Okay, uh, 
Docket number 16, case 22-072, Investigator McAvoy. Afternoon. Uh, again, this is case number OPS uh, 2022-0072. The complainant is Acadia Douglas. The date of the incident is March 13, 2022. The complaint was filed with uh, our office was March 23rd, 2022, as well as April 5th, 2022. The subject officers are Kyle Bachman, badge number 1996, and Dylan Coda, badge number 1927. A uh, brief summary of the allegations on uh, the Office also, also Professional Standards received a complaint from Mr. Douglas alleging uh, both Code and Bachman uh, resp responded to an anonymous call at a church and without justification they pulled their weapons and threatened to kill him. He asserted the officers did not have probable cause to stop him and uh, officers pulled their guns with their fingers on their triggers. Um, on April 5th, a supplemental complaint was received from Mr. Douglas. He stated in a complaint he believed the uh, stop was unlawful detainment a violation of his fourth amendment during the interview mr uh, douglas also stated that this is a form of continued harassment by the uh, cleveland police department mr douglas reported these officers did not activate their wcs cameras and it, this was a continued harassment allegation a was improper stop uh, we recommend uh, ops recommends a finding of exoneration uh, on allegation b use of force uh, OPS recommends a, a finding of exoneration and allegation C harassment. We find it, uh, we uh, recommend a finding of unfounded. Uh, regarding uh, improper stop, uh, the preponderance of the evidence, including WCS footage and interviews, disclosed officers Bachman and Coda were legally present to investigate a, uh, for a call at a break in at a church. The only description given to the pot was of the possible subject was a black male. The investigatory stop did. This investigatory stop did occur. The officer's actions were consistent with law, Cleveland Division of Police orders, training procedures. Therefore, the Office of Professional Standards recommends a finding of exoneration on improper stop for uh, both Officer Bachman and Officer Kodak. Regarding um, use of force, uh, the finest evidence handling WCS, including WCS footage and interviews, disclosed officers Bachman were legally present to investigate this call. Uh, the only description he had was a possible subject of black male. Uh, the compl uh, complainant had, had placed both his hands in his pockets. He was asked numerous times to remove uh, both his hands from his pockets as he as he failed to comply. He walked toward Officer Bachman, who was located on a sidewalk near such complainant. Officer Cota drew his weapon and pointed it at the gun, and Officer Bachman drew his taser and pointed it at the at the ground. Uh, because the complainant's hands were hidden in his pockets, there was no way to determine if the complainant had a weapon. When a complaining applied, Officer Cota reholstered his weapon as well as Officer Bo uh, Bachman reholstered his taser. Uh, based on the failure to comply with the repeated directive to remove his hands from his pockets, as well as the advancement of uh, of the uh, complainant tore Officer Bachman while maintaining his hands in his pocket. A use of force did occur, did not occur, uh, uh, but the officer's actions were consistent with law, Cleveland Division of Police training and procedures. Therefore, uh, OPS recommends exoneration for use of force on uh, allegation B. Regarding allegation C, continued uh, uh, has harassment by the Cleveland Police Department. Um, the preponderance of evidence, including WCS footage, interviews, which disclosed officers Bachman were legally present, uh, investigated a call for the break into the church. The only description was a black male. There was no evidence officers Bachman or Coda harassed his men after he was, a after they talked to him. Um, he said he was praying. They said he was free to pray. And the officer, the supervisor came and concurred with him. And there's no further uh, contact with the officers. Therefore, OPS recommends allegation C be uh, unfounded for harassment. Okay, thanks. Does anybody have any questions about the investigation? Okay, hearing none, does anybody have any motions they'd like to make? Well, okay, go ahead. Case 22-072. Uh, <clears throat> Officer Bachman, badge number 1996, allegation excessive force. I 
recommendation will be that this is unfounded. Um, they approached the complainant after they were dispatched on a call uh, for potential burglary at a church. Uh, the complainant kept his hands in his uh, jacket. WCS shows that multiple times they asked him to take his hands out of his pocket. They did, uh, or he did, Bachman, I believe, uh, removed his uh, service revolver. It can be seen in WCS that he did keep it pointed down toward the ground. And when the complainant removed his hands from his pocket, uh, he reholstered his weapon. So um, the there was not excessive force. It was uh, within uh, their right when, uh, when they couldn't see his hands and, and had given him an order to remove his hands from his pocket. They were uh, not in violation of any police orders of uh, excessive force at that point. So my motion will be that that is unfounded. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Mr. Mountcastle. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Uh, same case, Officer Coda, badge number 1927, allegation of excessive force. Um, the facts remain uh, similar to uh, what I just noted in the prior allegation. Uh, he had removed his taser and again put it back once uh, the complainant had removed his hands from his pocket and, and basically the, the whole situation was de-escalated entirely at that point. Uh, so I'll also <clears throat> uh, motion that that allegation be unfounded. Second. Uh, second for Mr. Mountcastle. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Uh, same case. Um, and I think I, I'll, I'll just reference it. Maybe I had the allegations out of order. Allegation B was excessive force, and that's what. Uh, those are the two motions I made previous. Um, the allegation A is improper stop um, against Officer Bachman, uh, badge 1997. I will recommend that this be exonerated. It, in fact, stop the complainant, but it was based on a call that they received, uh, and they had reasonable suspicion to stop him because the call indicated that a black male uh, was attempting to uh, break into the church is the information that they received. Um, and they uh, investigated that with the complainant, uh, ultimately reaching the conclusion that that wasn't what was going on, but the investigatory stop uh, was appropriate. So I will motion that be exonerated. Okay. Second. Okay, second for Mr. Mountcastle. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Same allegation, a um, improper stop against Officer Coda, or same rationale that I just uh, reviewed for uh, Officer Bachman. Uh, Officer Coda, badge number 1927. My motion is for ex exonerated of that allegation. Okay. Second. Uh, second for Mr. Mountcastle. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries. The final allegation is of harassment. Um, the officers were called to the site. They did, had no prior um, contact with the known contact with the complainant. They were actually uh, professional and somewhat polite uh, with the complainant. So with Officer Bachman, badge 1996, my motion will be that uh, 
he was following manual rule section 5.01 in terms of his conduct and speech and that the harassment allegation be unfounded. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Second from Mr. Mountcastle. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions? Okay, motion carries. Same case, same allegation. C, harassment, or the same rationale I just mentioned for Officer Bachman. Officer Coda, badge 1927. My motion is for that allegation to also be unfounded. Right. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Mr. Mountcastle. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Motion carries. All right. Uh, thank you, Dave. I think that covers it for that case. <clears throat> Next Ready to move is on. Docket 17, and to correct the docket, it's 22 134. Investigator McAvoy. Okay, again, this is OPS, uh, OPS case number 2022 0134. Complainant's name is Phil Richmond. The date of the incident is November, uh, June 3rd, 2022. The date of the complaint is uh, June 10th, 2022. And the subject officer is Dimitri, Dimitri Blackwell, badge number 710. Uh, allegation A, unprofessional conduct behavior. Allegation B, lack of service. On June 10th, the complaint of Ms. Phyllis Richmond submitted a complaint to the OPS office uh, alleging um, unprofessional behavior by um, Dimitri um, Blackwell. The complaint reported June 3rd, she called the police because an unknown male was banging on her door, her tenants, her downstairs tenant's door at 5.30 a.m. The complaint reported the responding officer Blackwell was unprofessional in his conduct. Uh, he was dismissive and ignored her during her encounter. Additionally, Ms. Richmond, uh, Ms. Richmond inform, informed OPS that uh, the officer uh, failed to, uh, have this have this man uh, leave the premises when he was when he didn't live there. Um, on uh, conclusion for unprofessional behavior, um, the preponderance of evidence, including WCS video uh, interviews, disclosed Officer Blackwell did in fact engage Miss Richmond in, uh, regarding the presence of an unknown male at the residence. However, while Miss Richmond attempted to engage Blackwell further in conversation, he waved his right hand upward and downward in her direction as Miss as uh, Miss Richmond was speaking to him. While uh, P.O. Blackwell believed Miss Richmond was unable to see his these hand gestures, it, re it remained that these gestures were ha had been observed by Miss Richmond or someone else. It could have been interpreted by someone that Blackwell was dismissive and essentially telling Miss Richmond to stop talking. Uh, the actions were uh, would tend to diminish the uh, esteem of the Cleveland Police Department uh, therefore, these actions were inconsistent with the Cleveland uh, Division of Police uh, GPO training procedures. Therefore, OPS recommends a finding of sustained on allegation A, unprofessional behavior from Demetria Blackwell. Okay, for uh, the conclusion for lack of service, the preponderance of evidence, uh, including WCS footage, audio recordings, uh, and interviews disclosed P.O. Blackwell uh, failed to provide service when he asked to have uh, Mr. Clark removed from the scene. In addition, he, uh, he did not perform basic uh, police practice to determine the identity of the individual or if the individual had warrants, any restraining order, or his criminal history. Uh, they watched Mr. Clark walk to his motorcycle and the officer left. In the interview with Mr. Blackwell, he admitted he did not observe Mr. Clark leave leave the scene. Based on the circumstances and statement by Ms. Weaver, who was the tenant downstairs at the time, um, that she was in fear for her life, uh, um, as well as the actions of Mr. Clark, the officer should have mentally conf uh, uh, confirm Mr. Clark's identity, conducted a records check, an outstanding warrants check, and, and determine if any uh, uh, protection orders uh, or and determine what his past criminal history was. Uh, Mr. Clark should have been directed to leave. The officer should have 
I advised him not to return and told Mr. Clark that the patrol officers would uh, periodically check on residents. None of these actions were taken by Officer Blackwell to scene. Um, after the officers left the scene, the first time Mr. Clark returned and damaged the property and uh, Ms. Mr. Weaver's vehicle. The actions of this officer were inconsistent with the Cleveland Division of Police uh, uh, police orders, training and procedures. Therefore, um, OPS is recommending to find you sustain an allegation B lack of service for Demetria Blackwell. Okay, thanks. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the investigation? Mr. Yes, Sharp, go ahead. Here, uh, investigator, um, the, the last part, so the officer not making sure that this suspect left the scene um, by not making sure, then there was subsequent damage to property after that because the, the suspect was still on the property? Correct. I, I, they don't know if the, if the individual left or not, but there were multiple calls by, by Miss Richmond afterwards as well as this Miss Weaver who was downstairs, who was a woman he was coming to see. He was banging mm -hmm. on the door. And um, I mean, he made a good point during his interview. He could have returned. Yeah, he could have. But uh, Sergeant Oliver, who they called to confer with at the scene, um, made a statement. And I, I interviewed him as well. You know, you're lucky you don't work for me because this would be a real issue. And his mm. statement to that was, they sh he said, you didn't even run this guy's name. You didn't even know who he was. So they they did. They essentially did nothing. And this woman called. She called um, uh, um, 911. And she said mm -hmm. on there, this guy was going off. That's why she left. And she told his officer, specifically Blackwell, he talked to her for five minutes in the back of the house. And she mm -hmm. said, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm afraid of this guy. I'm in fear for my life. And the mm -hmm. guy never, never took any action to determine who, who was there, why I was there. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, anyone else? Questions or thoughts? Does anybody have any motions they would like to make? Okay, uh, I'll make some motions then. So this is um, case 22-134. Uh, as to Patrol Officer Blackwell badge 710. On the allegation of unprofessional conduct, my motion is going to be to sustain that. Uh, preponderance of evidence, which includes testimony from the complainant subject officers and WCS footage of the encounter, indicates the alleged conduct, uh, which was behaving unprofessionally towards the complainant, um, specifically dismissing her attempts to, to try to get his attention and communicate him um, using kind of a, a hand wave, go away type gesture. Um, that did occur. Uh, and it was a violation of manual rules 5.01, 5.08, and 5.09. So the motion is to sustain. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Mr. Sharp. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, that motion carries. And then uh, I'm going to go to... I'm going to... Motion for a group one violation under discourtesy and rudeness. Second for a group one. I'm sorry, second. second. Oh, uh, okay. So all those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that motion will carry. And then uh, as to the allegation of lack of service against patrol officer Blackwell badge 710. Uh, my motion is going to be to sustain that as well. Uh, preponderance of evidence, which includes testimony from the complainant and subject officers, WCS footage of the encounter, and uh, some audio recordings of the, uh, the 911 calls, dispatch calls. Uh, indicate that the alleged conduct which was the officer failed to fully investigate the trespassing incident and take steps to ensure that the suspect would leave the premises uh, and keep the occupant safe did not occur 
Well, it, the, vi the violation did occur. Um, and it, things that could have been done but didn't get done would include that uh, the officer did not try to positively ID or like an identification card uh, for the suspect. Uh, he didn't stick around for very long after he asked him to leave the property. I think he saw him get on a motorcycle, but didn't didn't stick around to make sure that he was really leaving and not just hopping right back off or uh, just going around the block and coming back. Because um, his return ultimately did lead to some property damage on the property, and uh, and they could have taken some steps to prevent that. So that's a violation of uh, manual rules 4.01 and 4.0. 4.18. So again, that motion to sustain. Second. Second from Mr. Sharp. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that motion carries. And I can find a group level for that as well. M Mr. Chair, I, I would suggest um a group two uh because those actions at the end did lead to um property damage and we don't know where else it could have went so i would say group two um yeah i guess we we have uh We've been asked where we can to to make these fit as tightly as we can into one of the group violations, or at least articulate it as best as we can. I think uh, I think for me, this just looks like unsatisfactory performance. So my motion, everybody can feel free to disagree, but my motion is going to be for group one. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, motion's been seconded for group one. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mr. Oh. Sharp poses. Any abstentions? Okay, so that motion will carry. Uh, okay, and that covers it for that case. Is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. Thanks again. Uh, John, ready to move on when you are. I think you're on mute, Tom. Uh, my apologies. Case 18-22-252, Investigator McAvoy. Okay, again, this is uh, OPS, uh, OPS case number 2022-0252. Complainant's name is Michael Kincaid. The date of the incident is April 1st, 2022. The date of the complaint was October 13, 2022. The subject officers are uh, PO Justin Rioli, uh, badge number 2375, PO Joshua Brogan, badge number 491, and Detective Giovanni Leon, badge number 2468. Um, allegation A, a lack of service um, for uh, PO Justin Rioli and uh, Joshua Brogan, OPS recommends a goneration. Lack of service for Detective Giovanni Leon, OPS recommends sustained. Uh, for allegation B, uh, uh, de escalation discovered during the investigation, um, OPS recommends uh, a uh, for PO Justice uh, Justin Rioli, OPS recommends being, uh, being sustained. Summary of the complaint uh, on October 13th, OPS received a complaint from Mr. Kincaid. Who agreed to who alleged who said he agreed to be transported to St. Vincent's uh, Charity Hospital by EPM uh, EMS on April 1st, 2021. Well, en route, uh, EMS drivers were acting gay, so he asked to get out. EMS staff complied, so Mr. Kincaid exited the vehicle. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kincaid alleged while walking down the street, he was stopped by officers Brogan and Rioli, who reportedly handcuffed him and took him to St. Vincent Charity Hospital for an evaluation. A few months later, Mr. Kincaid was indicted on assault of an EMS driver. 
uh, Ms. Kincaid uh, alleged that uh, the Cleveland Division of Police indicted him without proper investigation. Okay, regarding uh, uh, lack of service, um, the W uh, review the WCS video disclosed the officers received a call in response to a possible assault on EMS personnel. They responded were advised the suspect Kincaid had taken off walking. The officers pursued Mr. Kincaid and when they observed him, they ordered him to get to the ground. After several directives, uh, Mr. Kincaid complied. He was eventually handcuffed and placed into the zone car while the officers spoke with the EMS personnel. Uh, Officer Raioli Roy spoke with uh, a witness, Ryan Sestroff, as well as the uh, a victim, Andres Cham Cham Chambus, uh, who reported he was grabbed around the th throat by Mr. Kincaid. Um, the, uh, the case, uh, was actually referred to the third district detective, uh, Giovanni Leon. Uh, he reviewed the police report, conducted telephonic interview of the victim, um, as well as, uh, the, um, witness, um, detective Leon uh, did not interview the suspect, Michael Kincaid. He reported searching for Ms. Kincaid's number in a field data reports, but there were no contact numbers listed. Uh, he noted Ms. Kincaid resided at the homeless shelter and did not have the number, so they did, they were in and out of there, so Detective Leon did not interview him. Um, and as much as uh, P.O. Rioli and Brogan located, stopped, and detained uh, Ms. Kincaid, completed the interviews of the victim as well as a the witness, they determined the facts of the incidents, they completed a police report, they secured a signed misdemeanor complaint by the victim from the victim, and they transported Mr. Kincaid to St. Vincent Charity Hospital for evaluation after it was determined he would not accept to be accepted by county jail. Uh, these were proper investigative procedures, which were consistent with the Cleveland Division of uh, Police as well as GPO's policy and training. Therefore, as previously stated, uh, OPS recommends uh, a finding of exonerated for PO Justin Rioli and PO uh, Joshua Brogan on a lack of service. Uh, the uh, As far as um, for uh, Detective Leon, um, the case was referred to the third district. Uh, he completed the investigation. Um, as noted, he did not he did not interview the um, complainant. When I interviewed him and asked why he didn't go to the homeless shelter to contact the man, uh, his response is, I could have, but I didn't. Um, therefore, based on, uh, based on uh, his, his admission during the um, uh, interview, as well as the lack, there's no interview, interview completed uh, in, in his police reports, uh, OPS recommends a finding of sustained for lack of service for Detective uh, Giovanni Leon, badge number 24668. Okay, uh, allegation de escalation, which was witnessed during the investigation. Um, WCS footage. Uh, demonstrated P.O. Rioli used profanity and aggressive tone in violation of GPO order uh, 2.01.02 section B. The section prohibits officers from taking unnecessary action, which may escalate the need to use uh, for the use of force. Uh, for example, aggressive body language, harsh level of tone, uh, of voice and tone. P.O. Rail is used for fanny along with his harsh tone. Directive was clearly unnecessary and may have escalated Mr. Kincaid's reaction to uh, to the officers, which may have escalated required use of force by by both officers. Considering the officers had some knowledge of complainant's mental health uh, history, and the immediate use of harsh profane language even made made this meet even more egregious. Well, there was there may have been instances where the use of profanity can be part of strategic commands, a prof, uh, profane use. Uh, Aggressive command should be employed prior, uh, uh, prior be before using uh, be less aggressive, uh, aggressive tactics. The recorded uh, statement in WCS established that honest evidence that the conduct did occur and was in, in uh, Mr. Um, P. O. Rowley's use of vanity, as long as his harsh tone and aggressive uh, voice were inconsistent with policy training in Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland Police Directives. Therefore, um, OPS recommends a finding uh, allegation B for the uh, failure to de-escalate be sustained. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions regarding the investigation? Ms. Hardy? I have questions. Um, 
Trent. Okay, I was trying to say Fanny, and your name is not up here. But it's, investigate. It's McAvoy. Okay, McAvoy. McAvoy. I don't have a camera yet. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, investigator, according to the wearable cameras um, system footage from um, Patrol Officer Bogan, you're saying that this was um, offer responded to a felony assault on EMS personnel. Okay. Um, I thought it was for a combative patient or a mental patient or something like that. Oh, so what did, tell us, what did this felony assault? Well, you listen, if you listen to 911 call, he assaulted him. He 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 grabbed him by the throat. It's on the 911 calls. I think there were there were, might have been five or five or seven uh, dispatch calls there. Okay, because on mine there was like two. Uh, from females, and I, I listened to them both, but I'll go back again. But they were saying combative, and then there was so much noise with the EMS until it was hard to distinguish what was being said. I know the police officer came over to the EMS. And that was another thing. You all did why didn't you interview? Did you interview the AV, what MS, what medical people? No, M I just I interviewed the police officers. What is it? M e e M S. E -M -S. E -M -S. Okay, E M S. Okay, so now was there a reason why you didn't interview the E M S? Well, because we, um, I knew what happened. I mean, he, he, you see on W C S, he filed a complaint. He signed a signed a complaint. I talked to the detective. Um, the man was indicted. You know, I'm concerned with with the actions of the police officers, not the E M S personnel. So he's he's so he, he was indicted. Okay, so let me ask you this, because I said it was so much noise, I really couldn't hear what was going on, and I kept playing it over and over uh, because the EMS was so loud. But the guy, one of the EMS um, texts was saying that um, he wanted to lay down, then he stood up, then he grabbed my shirt, then he someone stopped and he hit his head on the door and he hit his head on the door because the police officer said, well, do you want to file a complaint? And so then the other guy said, yeah, why not? He was first, he was like, you know, shugging his shoulders. Like, I don't know if I should file a complaint or not. Other guy was like, yeah. So I'm wondering how did, how did it go to a combative uh, mental patient? to a felony and i know he said it would be a felony assault so he said he grabbed his shirt he fell out the door he, hit well, his he head. also said that the ems driver also said i'm tired of people putting their hands on me if you remember that right because he grabbed him so he filed the complaint so right he grabbed his to, shirt he right, said he, he grabbed him by the throat is what what was said so he said shirt he said shirt so i you know i don't know if anyone else heard this or not but because I was like, well, how do they get combative patient to felony assault? Because he, he's a he's a first responder. You can't assault first responders. I mean, but right. these people yeah. going out, you know, they're they're putting their lives on the line to to help people who are in distress, and they want to make sure they're safe. So I hear your rationale. I'm sure it's enhanced because of that. Right, I hear your rationale, but again, a what is the definition of a felonious assault, a felony assault? He said that, you know, he was in the back laying down and all of a sudden he got up. They were asking him questions. I guess he didn't want to answer them. So he stood up and then for some reason, you know, like I said, I really couldn't understand. And, and some of my other board members, please help me out with this. And then he said, you know, I guess he stopped on the, the brakes or whatever and he fell. He, he was grabbing the man's shirt, the uh, tech shirt. And he didn't, you know, he would not have said anything unless the officer said, do you want to press charges? And he first asked him, he was like, I don't, you know, and then other one tech said, yeah, this, this, this needs to stop. So if someone, indicted. that's all I can say. He was, indicted. Were, so, yeah, you know, I can't, and, I can't speak to any of that. He was indicted. So, you know, that's, you know. So when you say he was indicted, what exactly does that mean? A well, grand jury indicted him. For, for, so he was charged. charged with felonious assault. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so he was charged with felonious. Um, yes. I think that the felony thing, um, 
I, I don't know this for sure. Maybe if somebody has uh, more knowledge of criminal law, but I think that any assault on a first responder, so like an EMT or a firefighter or a police officer, I think it's automatically classified as a felony if you assault a first responder. That's I correct. Wrong. Okay. 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 So he grabbed his shirt. So that's an automatic felony. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just for clarification, investigator, when you read your report, it sounded like, and I'm just trying to clear, it sounded like two different instances. One was when he was in the back of the ambulance and he asked to get out because they were acting gay. And then the second one seemed to be this incident where he actually, uh, grabbed the, uh, the, uh, EMS driver or, or passenger. Is this two different incidents or this is just one? Well, the incident where they, he said he were acting gay, so he asked to get out, was what he reported. Okay, oh, that was his statement. That his was statement. his statement. Yes. Okay, and but same, but same. The one where they grabbed him uh, was a statement of the um, AMS uh, um, victim. Okay, Chandler. but this is one. This is one yeah, incident. This is one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, everybody got it. Any more questions or thoughts on the case? Okay, does anybody have any motions they'd like to make? Okay, uh, I can go ahead and make some some motions here. Uh, we start with uh, Officer Riola, batch 2375 in case 22252, uh, the allegation of lack of service. Uh, my motion for that is going to be unfounded. Ponderance of evidence, including WCS footage of the encounter, written complaint from the complainant, uh, testimony from the subject officers, um, and I guess WCS uh, footage of also the, the victims um, who the officers are speaking to. Indicates the alleged conduct, uh, lack of service while responding to a report of an assault on an EMT, did not occur. Uh, the officers responded to the situation, uh, properly investigated it, and they also uh, transported the complainant uh, to the hospital. Um, so there was no violation of manual rule 4.18 or any other relevant CDP policy or procedure. So okay. motion for unfounded. Second from Mr. Mountcastle. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions? Okay, that motion carries. Uh, I'm going to move on to Officer Brogan, badge 491. Uh, the allegation of lack of service. Uh, I am going to make a motion that that is unfounded as well. Uh, very similar fact pattern and, and the same event. So I'm going to reincorporate my reasoning. Uh, from Officer Riola. Is that motion for unfounded? Second. Second from Mr. Mountcastle. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries. As to the allegation of lack of service against Detective Leon, badge 2468. Uh, my motion for that is going to be to sustain ponderance of evidence, including records of the investigation and um, the detectives, basically the detective's own admission uh, during his interview with OPS, indicates that Detective Leon failed to obtain a statement from the complainant during the course of his investigation, which is a violation of uh, the detective manual rules. Uh, and he kind of had a location, had a hard time getting a phone number, but didn't really make an attempt to uh, go to the homeless shelter, I believe, where the complainant was known to frequent uh, and try to track him down. So very little effort put into trying to actually interview him. Uh, so that motion is, again, to sustain. We have a second for that. Second. Okay, second from Mr. Sharp. 
All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, so we got to find a group level for that. Uh, I, I would say recommend group one. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's do a group one violation under uh, unsatisfactory performance. Yeah. Is that a second? Yeah, I'll second it as well. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions? Okay, motion carries. And then uh, the final thing is for Officer Real of Edge 2375, an allegation of uh, improper procedure that he failed to use de escalation tactics properly uh, during the course of Mr. Kincaid's arrest. My motion is going to be to sustain that as well. Preponderance of evidence, including WCS footage of the encounter and the complaint from the complainant and testimony from the subject officers. Indicates the alleged conduct uh, failing to properly use de escalation tactics while arresting Mr. Kincaid did occur. Uh, essentially, the officers got out of the car and Officer Riola immediately jumped to get the F on the ground. Um, I think we skipped over a whole bunch of steps there in between. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So that is a violation of the uh, the department's de-escalation tactics. It can be found in GPO 2.01.02. So uh, my motion, again, is to sustain. And do we have a second for that? I'll second. Okay, second from Mr. Sharp. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mountcastle in opposition. Uh, any abstentions? Okay, so the motion carries and I think uh, once again for the group level, I'm going to go with uh, group one under uh, tactics and violation of training. Mm. We have a second? I'll second that too, yeah. Okay, second from Mr. Sharp. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Okay, Mr. Mountcastle opposes. Any abstentions? No abstentions. Uh, and so the motion will carry. And I think it covers it for that case. Did we get them all? Correct. Okay, great. Okay, so before we conclude the presentation of investigations, I do have some information to pass along to the board. Uh, we did inquire of the mobile support unit about SWAT and cameras, because that was a request of the board. Uh, according to the mobile support unit, Sergeant Ball, SWAT is the only unit that does not have uh, WCS cameras. I don't have a reason for that, but I'm just letting the board know because that was an inquiry. <clears throat> Secondly, just for point of clarification, we uh, tabled docket five uh, because the board is requesting that investigator Delaney find out if a uh, investigation is, is ongoing. Uh, just for um, further discussion, maybe not today, but um, if the board is going to ask OPS about uh, Lack of service investigation, would, would they be willing to put something in writing when they're asking us when the allegation arises from an ongoing police investigation? Uh, there, there, I don't believe there'll be an issue with looking into whether the investigation is ongoing. We just want some clarification down the road should this issue come up again. And I think that's it. Okay. Hold on, uh, hold on one second. One one second. Yeah. Point of clarification. Are you talking about um, case two two dash zero three one that you said we that we tabled? Yes. Yeah. So 
so not only were we asking, um, is, is there an ongoing investigation? We want um, information from what has happened between now and then. Uh, as we talked about, there was one attempt to knock on the door. Is, was there a second? Was there any more communication? Not, okay. not just an answer. Yes, there's an ongoing investigation. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, I, I guess we will try to put a little thought into, um, maybe we'll vote on something next month that could give a little bit of clarification on what, what the timeline should be. I think that this one just feels weird because the time, the time that the, uh, that the case was in the detective hand was so short. It was only like, I think 10 or 15 days before the complaint was made. Okay. Um, so I, I feel like in that case, you know, it would be different if a detective had a case for a year. I think that that would be enough body of evidence to yeah. make a decision one way or the other. So I, I think maybe like, I, you know, we're just gonna have to think about how we want to word that. Thank um, you. So that's everybody's homework for this month. Okay. And, and can... I was just gonna say, just for the record, you do have that we we tabled two cases, yes. not just the one. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. There is um, there is number nine. Are you going to get to that number nine, or do you have a chief disciplinary decision nine, or do we need to discuss that or no? I, that was. Yes. Uh, that is, is next. There any other announcements or communications? I, I guess not. <clears throat> um, so number nine, just to make the board aware. This is a case that the board in December voted to have uh, taken to the director because it was the chief departed from the board's recommendation. This is case uh, 21-320. It's on your docket under review of director disciplinary decisions. Uh, just so the board is aware, the uh, director had held a hearing. I believe it was December 18th. I don't see the date on here, but um, that hearing, uh, the director, in essence, uh, kept the same decision as the chief. And so I just wanted the board to be aware that the director uh, reviewed the case and had a hearing and then uh, did not depart. The, he sustained Chief Drummond's decision that it's a group one offense. And this is just to inform the board. Okay. That's it from us, I think. Just questioning, have we have we got a statistician statistician on board yet? No, um, <laughs> we're working on it. Yeah. If, uh, uh, I'm ho we're hoping to conduct interviews. Fingers crossed. That, and, there's some numbers on these departures that um, trying we're trying to get some answers to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is this systemic or not? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody have anything else? Anybody aware of any other business that the board should take care of this okay. month? Before we adjourn. I guess the one thing I would say is, uh, <coughs> Mr. Perez, who is our, uh, our OPS administrator to be expressed to me some interest that he wants to uh, just kind of touch base with all the board members. So after this meeting, I'm going to provide his contact information with you. Um, if you have a preferred mode of contact, uh, phone number or, or an email that you'd like him to try to reach out to you instead, uh, you can send that to me and I can facilitate that. But he's trying to get in touch with the board members, just touch base and see where everybody's at. Um, so keep an eye out for that. That's about all I have. Anybody like to make a motion? Yes. Make a motion to adjourn. Nice. Nicely done. Uh, do we have a second? Yeah. Second for Mr. Sharp. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Aye. I'll see you guys next month. Thank you. All, all right. right. Thank you. Thank you.